education and tech training, as well as flexible step-up space for small businesses and entrepreneurs. This tech collaboration in the heart of Union Square is on city-owned land, but with a considerable portion of its square footage allocated for purely market rate commercial use. By signing this lease, the City of New York will lose control of this prime property for 99 years, meaning how we vote on these items and the commitments made by the developer, its partners, and the city will affect my district and New Yorkers for generations to come. Since my first day in office, I have asked this administration, EDC, and project partners for two things. One, a tech hub which gives a leg up to the members of our community who need it most, and two, some sort of commitment to the adjacent communities that their homes and small businesses will be protected from hyper-development. As advertised by EDC, this project has the potential to provide the digital skills training and workforce development my community has been demanding for many years. It has the potential, and I underline potential, to provide women and people of color pathways to high-paying jobs in the city's growing tech industry that have been out of reach for decades. And it is my mission to make this type of programming a reality for my neighbors. However, the conversations I have had about the on-site benefits as currently proposed have fallen short of what a city-owned project should provide. This site should serve as a gateway to new technology and innovation for New Yorkers in perpetuity and provide maximum and tangible public benefits. Furthermore, this tech hub must not undermine the fabric of the community surrounding it. And therefore, the vision for this area must include protections from continued out of scale and financially out of reach development. Anyone who is skeptical that this tech hub would not have a major impact on the affordability and character of the neighborhoods surrounding Union Square need only look a few blocks to the south at 51 Astor Place, the construction of which accelerated the expansion of large corporate office space within nearby buildings that used to have a more significant mix of business types and sizes. And as we saw with the fo former Bullmore Lanes, a site once thought undesirable for tall luxury projects by area residents and even city planning, a speculative high-end market has more and more of the neighborhood in its crosshairs. Since the certification of this application, I have felt that the community's requests for land use protections have, been con have not been seriously considered. Even though neighborhood advocates and organizers continue to contact my office and this administration asking for their vo voices to be heard, concerns have been pushed aside in the interest of expediting a project that relevant agencies would have us believe, incorrectly in my view, should be considered in isolation of its surroundings and devoid of maximum input. One of the reasons I decided to run for office was because having worked at a local community-based nonprofit, I saw where our city fell short in involving the community in decision making. We missed critical openings to have larger conversations around sense of place that is merited during ULERPs, especially when it involves the disposition of city-owned land. At the end of the day, the people who have to live with the effects of land use changes are those that reside in the neighborhoods around them. I look forward to hearing from the project stakeholders today and how they plan to create a tech hub that brings high quality, low cost, or free education to tenants from Fifth Avenue to Avenue D. I also look forward to hearing how we can get the workforce development digital skills training center we deserve without having to threaten the scale, character, and affordability of our neighborhoods only with a comprehensive, holistic approach to both access to technology and protections of our vibrant neighborhood can I vote confidently for this project. And right now that vote is seriously in question. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and all of my colleagues. And thanks, of course, to all of the advocates and the stakeholders here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sergeant at Arms. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Rivera, for your statement. Uh, I would now ask the council to uh, swear in the panel. Before speaking, please state your names. 
Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Um, why don't you just um, s state your names and say yes into the mics. My name is Jillian McLaughlin, and yes, I will answer all questions truthfully. Josh Ween, and yes. Emily Sukas, yes. Andrew Roche, yes. Spencer Levine, yes. You can begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya, members of the Land Use Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises, and Councilmember Rivera. My name is Jillian McLaughlin, and I am an Assistant Vice President at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I am here to present the Union Square Tech Training Center located at 124 East 14th Street. On behalf of EDC, I want to thank the Council and members of the community for attending today's meeting and participating in the ULERT process. New York City's tech sector is growing. Tech companies and tech careers account for almost 300,000 jobs in the city and span every industry, from fashion to media to finance. And tech jobs are good jobs. The average salary is $70,000 to $80,000 a year, and unlike other high-paying sectors, 44% of these jobs are accessible to those without a college education. These are exactly the kinds of opportunities Mayor de Blasio championed in his 2017 New York Works Plan, where he committed to creating 100,000 good-paying jobs over 10 years. Due to the growth of good jobs in the tech sector, the city has made investments to strengthen the sector and ensure the benefits it brings are broadly shared among New Yorkers. The city supports a network of accelerators and incubators throughout the city to encourage startups to expand within the five boroughs and is also invested in programs and policies that prepare New Yorkers for the digital economy. Mayor de Blasio created the Computer Science for All program to teach every public school student computer science by 2025 and launched the Tech Talent Pipeline with the city's tech employers to bring high quality tech education to New Yorkers with limited financial means. Community Board 3 has also shown interest in cultivating the technology sector and called for the creation of a business incubator in their most recent district needs statement to expand employment opportunities for residents in lucrative career pathways. These citywide policy goals and local needs shaped the request for proposals EDC released in 2015. The RFP challenged the city's development community to propose a project that provided flexible office space for growing technology startups and included educational uses that would equip New Yorkers of all backgrounds with the skills they need to thrive in a modern digital economy. The RFP generated a tremendous amount of interest and ultimately we selected REL companies to develop the Tech Training Center with Civic Hall as its anchor tenant because their vision for an inclusive tech se sector most closely aligned with ours. REL and Civic Hall recruited compelling partners, committed to long-term restrictions on the use of the Tech Training Center, and included the most community benefits of the proposals we received. RAL and the city will enter a 99-year ground lease for the property, and as a condition of the ground lease, RAL will construct and operate a building that includes retail space with opportunities for new entrepreneurs, flexible office space for startups, a digital skills training center that will offer affordable and accessible courses, event space available to the community, and space for Civic Hall, a nonprofit devoted to using technology for the public good. The city already received ULERP approval to dispose of the site in 1983, and the city has the option to build a smaller project with fewer public benefits than the one under consideration today, but chose to seek an additional ULERP approval to expand the scope of benefits. The rezoning actions we are requesting include rear yard, height, and setback wafers, as well as changing the underlying zoning district to a C64. These zoning actions would increase the project's public benefits and provide deeper, flexible floor plates that can support the dynamic program plan for the building. These changes allow the city to provide six additional floors than would have been possible in an as-of-right project. EDC, RAL, and Civic Hall met with local stakeholders and the community board extensively prior to ULERP certification and received unanimous approval with conditions from the community board in February. We received approval from the borough president in March and the unanimous approval from the city planning commission last month. The tech training center has been improved by the feedback provided by each of these stakeholders and we look forward to hearing from the city council and members of the public today. 
Spencer Levine and Josh Ween of REL Companies will describe the building's components and the requested ULURP actions in greater detail. Emily Sukas of Urban Space will discuss the market space plan for the building. And Andrew Roche of Civic Hall will discuss the portions of the building that his organization will sublease. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, and thank you, uh, members of the council, for hearing about the project today. Um, I'm Josh Ween from RAL. Um, I want to start off by talking a little bit about the, about the uh, location of the building and put it into context. The site is located on the south side of 14th Street, directly at the end of Irving Place. 14th Street, as many of you know, is a four-lane road in two directions. It's a commercial corridor um, directly adjacent to Union Square. What we liked about this location, and specifically for the type of building that we're going to be developing here, or hope to be developing here, is there's easy access from all five boroughs. So we wanted to create a building that would really be for all New Yorkers. Union Square is a hub and a location that provides real opportunity to create something that can be utilized by everyone and not just another Class A office building. When we received the original RFP from the city, we thought about what the city was trying to achieve and how we can promote 21st century jobs throughout all aspects of the building. We did this through four main components, education, networking opportunities, startup businesses, and ultimately job opportunities. We were introduced to Civic Hall and really bought into their mission of trying to make technology for the public good. We tried to find other uses that would complement and expand that vision as well. We started with an education facility. Civic Hall actually wanted to create an education facility that promoted workforce development and digital skills training. And they worked with local organizations to create a pipeline for students. We also wanted to create job opportunities that were really for high paying technology jobs that also fulfill living wage and higher NYC requirements that we've agreed to with um, New York City's Economic Development Corporation as part of our ground lease. Finally, we've agreed to build and operate this building using union labor. As part of our ground lease with EDC, we've made significant binding developer commitments to the project. Starting from the ground floor going up, on the ground floor of this building, we're gonna have a market space in partnership with Urban Space. And Emily will talk a little bit more about um, Urban Space's business model and how they um, work with entrepreneurs as well. We've listed the community feedback regarding no big box retail. So you'll hear again from Emily about the vendors being more locally focused. Um, as again, trying to create New, uh, promote newer businesses, we, we agreed to a half mile radius restriction, um, and we also agreed to no more than five locations within the borough of Manhattan for any of the vendors within the food hall. Finally, in order to promote entrepreneurship as part of the food hall, um, no, 25% uh, of all market vendors are reserved for first time entrepreneurs. The next six floors in the building are gonna be master leased to Civic Hall, and it'll be operated in three different components. The first component, which you'll see as an event space, is really geared towards community user events, as well as events that are for the technology industry. Originally, as part of our RFP, um, as a part of our ground lease with EDC, we agreed to make the event space available to local um, organizations, either free, or free of charge or at cost, 32 times a year. We've since agreed to increase that to 52 times a year. Above that, we have three floors that are dedicated to digital skills training. This space is, um, is restricted for the full 99 years of our ground lease um, and will be licensed out to different um, technology training organizations. And finally, the uh, remaining two floors of the Civic Hall space will be an expansion of Civic Hall's current operation, which Andrew, Roche, Andrew Roche will expand on in a little bit. Above that, we have five floors, what we're calling step-up office space or flexible office space. We really tried to address here the ability for startup organizations to, to get affordable office spaces within prime Class A office building and prime locations in Manhattan. Right now, it's very difficult for startup organizations who don't have a large bankroll to put up a large security deposit um, or, or agree to a 10-year or longer lease. So what this space does is it, it agrees to making no, the lease is no shorter than six months, and that's to prevent traditional co-working spaces, and no longer than five years. And again, that's in order to make it more accessible and more affordable to some of these startup organizations. 
Um, the developer has also agreed to build out these spaces as flexible office space for these organizations. So it, it, the build out cost is typically prohibitive for a lot of these organizations. So by the, develop, the developer actually building it out, it makes it again more accessible. And finally, the traditional office space above will provide job opportunities and will also help subsidize a lot of the, the components in the lower portions of the building that are being given back to the city and to the local organization at below market rents. I'd like to pass it on to Emily Sukas now, who will talk about urban space. I, I just want to take this moment to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Torres, uh, Richards, and Reynoso, who have joined us uh, here today. Thank you. Urban Space was founded in 1972, and during its 40 plus years of existence, the company has developed well over 50 projects. Urban Space cultivates environments rich in creativity, places where local makers collaborate, exchange ideas, and showcase their wares. Fostering community by transforming city spaces, we are motivated to provide the platforms on which artisans, entrepreneurs, and chefs succeed. In 1993, Eldon Scott established the first urban space market in New York City with the founding of the Grand Central Holiday Fair. That same year, urban space created the Union Square Holiday Market, the first of our outdoor holiday markets in New York. Today, urban space operates multiple food and retail markets across New York City. While the locations and offerings vary at our markets, one thing remains the same, being in and of the communities in which we operate. Urban Space has been a member of the Union Square community for the past 25 years as the founder and operator of the Union Square Holiday Market. In partnership with the Union Square Partnership and New York City Parks Department, we are proud to have created a community market that has gleaned an international reputation as one of the must-see destinations during the holidays in New York City. Our focus is always on the vendors, working with as many local artisans and makers as we can. In recent years, with the growing demand for local, we have expanded parts of the Union Square Holiday Market to embrace just that. We've added specialty market sections, such as Urban Space Provisions, which is specifically for local food purveyors, and Little Brooklyn, which features only wares made in our neighboring borough of Brooklyn. Urban Space would have no work to do without our vendors. Our vendors are truly our partners in all aspects of our business. From helping us choose our next locations, to recommending new vendors for our markets, to supporting one another in growing and expanding business, our vendors are what enable us to make markets and build community. We are excited to be part of the CB3 community as it is home to some of New York City's best chefs and makers. In the past 10 years of food market operations alone, we have had the benefit of featuring over 20 food vendors who are local CB3 residents and or business owners. Since this Euler process has started, I've connected with new businesses in CB3, such as Mikey Likes at Ice Cream Shop, to talk about future opportunities and offer advice about expanding their business. We have committed to 25% of the food kiosks to be dedicated to small entrepreneurs or first-time business owners. Our team of market directors and managers spend a lot of time going out into the community exploring neighborhoods, attending other markets, fairs, festivals, and expos to spread the word about our markets and to find new partners. We always cross-promote with our partners and landlords to ensure we have as diverse an offering as possible that represents the community in which our market exists. At Urban Space's existing market spaces, 37% of businesses are owned by women or people of color. For our holiday markets, approximately 54% of businesses are women-owned and 56% are minority-owned. Urban Space works with over 500 small businesses each year through its food halls, pop-up food markets, and holiday markets. Urban Space is receptive to referrals from the Community Advisory Board to be formed as part of this project. And beyond this project, Urban Space always welcomes recommendations of vendors who would like to test concepts at our other pop-ups and market locations. We are in constant communication with our vendors to help them grow their businesses. Many first-time business owners start at our pop-up markets for a four to six week stint. Based on their experience at a pop-up, they are able to tweak their offerings, gain acceptance into other popular and revenue driving markets, graduate to a permanent food hall space with us, and or go on to open their own brick and mortar. For example, by participating at the Union Square Holiday Market, CB3 Business Macaroon Parlor was able to finally open a permanent location on St. Mark's Place. Since then, they opened another location on the Upper West Side, 
outgrew their St. Mark space and relocated to Hester Street and started a new business and nonprofit called Meow Parlor, which was the first kitty cafe in New York City and serves as a feline adoption center. Urban space cultivates environments rich in creativity, places where local makers collaborate, exchange ideas, and showcase their wares. Fostering community by transforming city spaces, we are motivated to provide platforms on which artisans, entrepreneurs, and chefs succeed. We are equally excited to be part of a building community that is built on the foundation of interconnectedness and support of startups. With that, I'll turn it over to Andrew Roche, the founder of Civic Hall, to speak to the opportunities and resources this project will provide for tech learners and businesses alike. Good morning. My name is Andrew Roche. It's an honor to be here at the City Council and to see such an amazing array of citizens participating in our democratic process. 20 years ago, I was a small business owner in Union Square. Actually, I've lived in Union Square my entire adult life in New York. And I was using the internet to help me grow my business, and I was part of New York's burgeoning technology community. As a uh, citizen of New York, I uh, tried to be a good community partner uh, with my neighbors, and I joined the 14th Street Bid, which had adopted Washington Irving High School as a place for members of the community to try and help. And I walked into that school and was shocked to discover 3,000 kids, 97% on school lunch, and not a single computer anywhere in the school. I was shocked. I sent an email to 10 friends asking them to help me build a computer lab in that school on a Saturday. And to my surprise, 200 people showed up. And we somehow figured out how to build that computer lab but more importantly, it inspired me to start a nonprofit organization called Mouse and to take on wiring up as many New York City public schools to the internet as possible. Today, I'm proud to say that Mouse is active in almost 100 New York City public schools and in every borough. Not only making sure the schools are wired, but providing digital skills training to the students who in turn provide those same skills to their teachers and to their other students and even their parents. But over the same 20 years since Mouse got started, I've seen two, and I've witnessed two divergent trends. One is the rise of the New York technology community itself, which is rising in, a, in, a, in, in response to the changing global economy, where now every single New York City industry is competing to find workers, and to be able to sell their wares and to conduct business in an economy that changes every single day at a faster and faster pace. The second and more challenging trend, however, is that the digital divide no longer just refers to the access to the internet. It also refers to things like skills necessary to find a job, or skills necessary to help your community, or even the skills necessary to run for office. In response to this challenge, my longtime collaborator, and I, uh, Mika Sifri, and I opened a facility called Civic Hall three years ago as a center for the public good where New Yorkers from all over the city could come to meet and collaborate to solve some of the city's most pressing problems. Since opening in 2015, we have attracted over 1,000 individual members and 100 organizations, including 12 government agencies we have produced over 1,500 community events, um, trainings, hackathons, panel discussions, um, and, uh, and other community events, including a, uh, over the last two years with the New York City Council, a um, digital inclusionary summit, which has been held at Civic Hall. You may have heard about a couple of organizations that came out of Civic Hall. As a matter of fact, one that I would like to highlight is called the New York Veterans Alliance, which was started by an entrepreneur, an organizer by the name of Kristen Rouse, who came back from Afghanistan and was shocked to discover that there were not enough services and resources available to recent veterans. And she came to Civic Hall to see if she could maybe start an organization. And through the people that she met and through the resources of Civic Hall, she not only started an organization, but helped participate in a coalition that eventually got this council to pass a bill with a $3 million budget creating the New York City Department of Veteran Services. And I'm happy to say the New York City Department of Veteran Services is now also a member of Civic Hall. 
and Kristen Rouse is constantly uh, criticizing them when she can and offering support and advice and support uh, as they work together to make sure that all veterans in New York receive the best services possible. When we heard about the city's effort to create this center for economic opportunity and job creation in Union Square, we were inspired. We've, we're lucky enough to be able to partner with RAL and we provided a vision to the city where any New Yorker, whether they be a student, a teacher, an immigrant, someone who's disabled or legally challenged, an elderly person could come and walk into a building and be able to get digital skills training for free. We joined with a couple, uh, several best-in-class workforce development organizations that work with these different constituencies, including Perscolis, FedCap, CUNY, Mouse, I'm happy to say, Access Code, then the New York Computer Science Foundation, which is responsible for partnering with the city for the Computer Science for All initiative to make sure that every single New York City public school student gets computer education within the next 10 years. They've all agreed to partner with us to offer these trainings and even more New Yorkers than they currently serve, not only in this location, but throughout the city that could come and be able to access digital skills training, as I mentioned before, for free. I hope you will recognize this urgent and extraordinary opp opportunity we all have to create a galvanizing new facility that will support not only the organizations that I just mentioned, but also the entire workforce development community for all the generations who come after us. Thank you very much. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our partner, Spencer Levine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I get the liberty to walk you through some of more of the technical, physical aspects of the project. Uh, starting off with the step-up office space, uh, Josh just mentioned some of the elements of this project, but the, the program here was actually developed in response to some of the early community board need statements that we uh, reviewed with EDC and, and on our own in responding to the RFP. Uh, it, the intent is for the program to foster job growth and employment opportunities for early stage companies and provide opportunities for companies that would otherwise not be able to afford tr more traditional office space. They've grown out of the one desk and they're ready for a real office. Uh, so some of the commitments that we've made and we've developed this table just as a side-by-side -side comparison to better understand how we see the step-up office space as it relates to traditional. Uh, you know, the, the expected size for a step-up office space is somewhere between 1,500 and 5,000 square feet. The lease term, as Josh mentioned, is anywhere between six months and five years, where a typical traditional office lease is, is five, 10, 15, 20 years, and there's uh, renewal options on top of that, but they're very long-term commitments. The tenant build-out is, in this case, for the step-up office space by the developer, so they'd be pre-built and funded by us. There's no guarantees are limited to one year often in traditional office spaces our higher length of the lease term which is a major to securing some of these office spaces size but one of the more most important the idea of flexibility so the idea behind the step up office space is today or six months six months a uh, company might need a thousand square feet in a year, it could need 5,000 square feet, and in two years, it might need a reduced square footage again. So the, the terms, the flexibility in how the space is built, uh, the, share, the idea of using shared services and common spaces within these, uh, these floors pro provides that spatial flexibility that these companies are looking for and need. Uh, as, as discussed earlier, uh, we are seeking three, it's really four uh, zoning actions as part of this ULERP. Uh, the first one, the site currently exists in four different zone, it's a one zoning lot within four different zoning districts. We're seeking to simplify the zoning on that site and have it all come under C64. Uh, we, it's on here, so we are as a precedent to all rezonings in the city. Uh, the site is being mapped for an MIH area, although there is no uh, residential permitted under our lease with the city. Uh, it's just the precedent of the city, so that was requested of us. 
Uh, we would allow the project area to benefit from some bulk waivers and a modification to the rear yard and height and setback, which are the sky exposure plane along 14th Street. Uh, this map here shows side by side the existing conditions of the uh, zoning districts and the proposed rezoning action uh, to conform the entire site to C64. It's C64 does exist on the property already, so it is a, it's just a simplification of the existing zoning on the zoning, on that zoning lot. So this slide um, highlights the two major, um, or the, the two main zoning actions that we're seeking to allow for the program to take place. Uh, Jillian mentioned early on that the program takes advantage of the larger floor plate setbacks. Um, we are seeking to uh, waiver to the sky exposure plane requirements along 14th Street, which would actually provide for a more contextual setback on the building. It would align with the setbacks on either side of this building. And a waiver of the rear yard setback requirements. There's kind of a, a weird situation where if this were not a single zoning lot, the rear yard setback that we're proposing, which is 52 feet, would actually be in excess of the as of right condition. But because this is a single zoning lot shared with the help property, uh, and the help property is residential and our building is commercial, the, uh, the setback requirement would goes to 60 feet. So we are actually seeking a waiver to a 52 foot separation. Uh, this. The, these zoning actions allow for the larger floor plates, uh, more light and air into the building. They provide for increased capacities for all the uses that we discussed early on. Uh, and it really, it makes the programming uh, more feasible in its application. So things like, you know, we'll talk about the, the uh, event space we've spoken about, but an additional 5,200 users a year that's based on the 52 times that it's made available at an additional 100 people because of the floor plate and setback requirements. This is a rendering of the building from uh, Irving Place looking toward south towards 14th Street. Uh, the building, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about it, but it's designed around the idea that there's a social aspect to the building. So the one thing that I'll point out in this rendering is along the uh, western edge of the building, there are these two-story spaces which we are considering the living rooms, and those are areas of shared or um, social interaction without, within the building. There are spaces where there might be uh, meeting rooms, community lounges, uh, and they're accessible to the tenants on, on the floors that, um, are, that they're adjacent to, as well as the, the pieces within the Civic Hall um, master lease would be accessible to all their users as well. This is another rendering of the building at 14th Street level, and I wanted to take the opportunity to just point out that we've actually found the ULERT process to be a very informative, helpful process in refining our scope and ensuring that we're meeting the needs of the local community. We've spent a lot of time uh, on outreach, and, and because that's how we work, um, RAL works in that way. We, we really like to be good neighbors and we like to be part of the community. Some of the things that have come out of all these discussions, all these meetings, uh, are, are substantive changes to our program to better accommodate some of the feedback that we've gotten. Uh, in, you know, we've, some are as simple as we've committed to no amplified sound after 10 p.m. on the roof per the community board recommendation. We've increased access from the least required 32 times per year to 52 times per year uh, to the event space to ensure community access and use for reduced or free. Um, Civic Hall will be establishing a community advisory committee to make sure the community has access and program and the programming responds to the local needs. And there's a there's a system of uh, reporting that comes along with that. Uh, we have and continue to have very informative and productive conversations with Lesson about how they can participate with, for local employment as well as benefit from the digital skills training for our employment placement opportunities. Uh, we've, we have ongoing conversations with them and then working closely with uh, Council Member Rivera as well and based on the Community Board 3 recommendation, we will be establishing a scholarship fund to ensure access to the digital skills training portions of these buildings, of the building. Um, with that, I think
turn it over to you. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for your testimony. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, what are the proceeds to EDC from this lease? Thank you, Council Member, for your question. It's important to EDC that our real estate projects provide significant benefits to the community, and we received proposals that offered to pay EDC significantly more rent for the project, but we selected the proposal before you because it provided the deepest public benefits. And as a result, we are receiving $2.3 million in rent. And we believe, based on our understanding of the market, that this represents more than a 50% discount to what we could charge if the project did not include the public benefits. And part of the discount in rent is paying for permanently subsidized <coughs> workforce development space so that nonprofits can afford to <coughs> run space within the building to offer scholarships to students who take classes at courses that are offered by a for-profit provider and to provide event space um, at discounted rates or free of charge to the community, as well as space for startups. In the past, have the revenues from this kind of project been used to support local communities? For, for this particular project, a significant amount of the rent that we could charge has been invested back in the project to benefit the community. I'm talking in, in the past. Have there been other developments where you've had similar uh, uh, proceeds and used the revenues uh, for projects like this to support local communities? I mean, I think that we always strive to meet the needs of local communities through the actual program in the buildings and through revenues that we receive. For this project, the revenue that we receive in rent will be used to support economic development projects throughout the five boroughs. Okay. Um, the additional space for nonprofits, um, you might have touched upon this. Are there, uh, there are requests from the community regarding additional space for local nonprofit organizations? Is the proposed planning to allocate any additional space? We have, we have devoted six floors of this 21-story building to um, uses that benefit the community. We believe that the Digital Skills Training Center will serve a tremendous amount of students with the three floors that it has, and we have three floors for Civic Hall. Civic Hall has memberships of which many community organizations um, participate in, and so we, um, we think that the current benefits are significant. With the L train shutdown, how do you plan to ensure construction doesn't further uh, exacerbate the? Uh, we, we've committed early on. We've worked very closely with um, DOT and the city agencies with what information they have regarding the L train shutdown to make sure that we are coordinating and sequencing and, and really defining the logistics of this project early on. Uh, we do have a uh, you know, our general contractor as well as our team has been meeting with them. Um, we, our, uh, our seeker is actually includes all of our mitigation that we've taken to this point, inclusive of um, we would be, we've done things like um, move, the crane will be inside the footprint of the building, the hoist will actually be on the back side of the building to um, not impede pedestrian traffic along 14th Street. We've made concessions as to how much of that sidewalk space we, we will actually take for staging and logistics, and really it's the bare minimum required for a safe pedestrian experience. Uh, we've also conceded, and, and typically on, on a project of this size, in a normal condition, um, we, would have, we would be able to uh, garner a lane closure. We are not seeking a lane closure for the construction of this project. We'll obviously have periods of time that will be well coordinated with whoever is has jurisdiction over the street at that time um, to make sure that our, our deliveries and, and staging is well planned at that time. But we are very conscious of it and working to mitigate the impact to anyone. In relation to the adjacent residential building, um, for the rooftop space, uh, what are going to be the hours of operation? And how will the rooftop noise be controlled since the proposed development will be uh, abutting the supportive housing building to its rear? So the rooftop is only to be used by uh, tenants within the building. There won't be any outside events or anything held up there. There'll be no amplified sound, which we've agreed to as a request from the community board past 10 p.m. 
um, and there won't be any, one of the other requests is there won't be any food and beverage uh, served up there either. And will there be like uh, rules of conduct posted on the roof? There absolutely will, just like there is in every single one of our buildings. We haven't gotten to the point where we've actually developed what those will be at this point. Okay. And in terms of accessibility to the landscape uh, open area in the rear yard, uh, will tenants of the supportive housing uh, and the office workers be able to access such open space, or is there an area that is separated by the two users? Yes, yeah, so here. So what we actually did is, if you could look at the property line right there, mm -hmm. uh, we have, we, our site actually goes um, through that whole property line. We're actually giving back the right side of our rear yard back to the Help USA building to our, to our south um, and allowing them to use that at their discretion. The one to the left, which is our terrace, is only gonna be used by um, the food hall customers. And what you know, you're at with that? Uh, generally, our hours of operation are from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m., and we most likely will have a breakfast service, so somewhere starting around 8 a.m., still to be solidified later on. Thank you. Uh, I now uh, turn it over to Councilmember Rivera. Thank you so much. Thanks again for all of your testimony. Um, so can you explain the difference between the workforce training floors and the non-workforce floors that are leased to Civic Hall? And are there differences in how each, how long each runs with the building? For example, the 25 years compared to the 99 year lease? I'll let Andrew talk about um, how he's gonna operate those floors, but in terms of the ground lease with EDC, um, the event space and the two floors of Civic Hall are a 25 year use restriction. Um, and the three floors of digital skills training are a 99 year use restriction and rent restriction at uh, $50 a square foot. And then Andrew, you can talk about So Councilwoman, I, um, I'm not quite sure I'll completely answer your question because it could be answered either from a legal lease perspective or how it operates. So if I'm not getting it right, let me know. Okay. Um, so uh, the entire workforce development community is currently challenged. Many organizations are trying to figure out how to upgrade their skills, uh, their, the skills that they offer to 21st century um, um, methodologies, and they're, are, they're chasing after the same money for uh, funding their programs, and they're trying very hard to connect to employers so they can actually place people in jobs. Um, these organizations are disparate and there's actually no center of gravity for them. So when we pre presented this proposal to the city, our vision was, was there should be a shared workforce development center where there would be approximately 20 classrooms and each of the partners, whether they be citywide partners like the ones I mentioned or local ones like Lesson or others in the Lower East Side, would be able to come and just be able to rent or license in effect classrooms for their use without the um, extra overhead costs of having to lease and maintain their own space and not necessarily be able to use it all hours of the day. So that the overall cost for running a facility and providing digital skills training would be reduced for every single one of the users. We also anticipate that those same workforce development organizations would be able to share pedagogy and data, potentially students, and teachers, and connections to employers so that there would be more efficiency, not only for those who are in the building, but for the entire workforce development community as a whole. So let me, let me just ask, so you have assessed that typically, I guess even our area or citywide, there isn't enough workforce development for the tech center existing, and the, that you're trying to bring that, not only into the Union Square area, but you're trying to provide it as a service to New York City. Yes, that's correct. So you are going to, provide space to other nonprofits to be able to do workforce development. Correct. But because you have assessed that uh, other organizations aren't necessarily doing the kind of tech digital skills training that we need in order for the typically underrepresented people to enter the tech industry, how are you going to work with them to make sure that this is not just a community space, that it is truly going to serve the mission of why you are chosen as the sub lessee? So, as I mentioned, we brought together some of the best-in-class workforce development organizations in the city that currently are serving the constituencies that I mentioned, the students, the teachers, the elderly, 
immigrants, people with physical or legal barriers, uh, and others. And many of the, and all of those um, are providing some digital skills training, if not entirely digital skills training, some digital skills training for their constituencies. There are many other workforce development organizations that provide other kinds of workforce development that have not yet fully been able to participate in offering digital skills training to their constituencies or in their communities because of lack of resources to be able to not only provide those services but to be able to rent space. The idea here is to create a center of gravity for not only these organizations that I mentioned, but for others in the community to be able to come together, learn from each other, support each other, and be able to galvanize the entire workforce development community to be able to upgrade itself from teaching our citizens 20th century jobs and giving them 21st century opportunities. And I'd like to add, particularly focused on underserved communities and women of color. So the the partnerships that you've created, um, are any of them, most of them are nonprofit. I know Perscalis, I'm glad that you're working with CUNY, that's wonderful. W are there any for-profit uh, partners? At the moment, there aren't. We, uh, in our original proposal, we did include a support letter and a letter of interest from General Assembly, which is a well-known tech training organization, mostly focused on their professional classes. They charge for their services, they are a for-profit, about 20% of their students are actually on scholarship. But the reason why they're not formally part of the program today is that they recently were purchased by a much larger nationally based tech training organization. And we have not yet had an opportunity to meet with them to make sure that they, or that they're, to see if they're still interested in being part of the project. If they were, we would, con we would confirm before we got anywhere into discussions with them for the use of the space that over 20% of the students that would be trained in our facility would be getting those trainings for free. So yeah, that's my concern is that I wanna make sure that the low cost portion is, is truly accessible and I know you're gonna provide a lot of services for free. And you know, EDC, uh, Jillian, you mentioned the computer science for all rollout and so my concern is we already have a very inequitable education system. You can see that very acutely just in my own district between the two school districts that are neighboring each other on 14th Street. So when you don't have the computer science in elementary, middle, and high school to even take the boot camp that General Assembly might offer for $12,000, you know, I wanna make sure that we're not just giving social media 101, that we're providing real classes that are gonna give you that opportunity to make the, the 70 to $80,000 a year that you mentioned. And you said 44% of these jobs are accessible to those without a college education. I'd be interested to see those demographics if you have it as to who's accessing those jobs without a college education. But I wanted to just make sure that we're all working together and that you're working with community-based organizations at the very grassroots level because these, this, my concern is that I'm not gonna see people from where I grew up on Avenue C and Avenue D and Pitt Street, that they're not gonna make it into the Digital Skills Training Center. That it's gonna look a lot of the same and it's gonna look like you know, the, the tech alley and, and I wanna make sure that it's gonna be reflective of the city where I grew up. Uh, Councilman, if I can, um, I've been around New York long enough to know what happens at, uh, process, through processes like this where developers come and make promises about what's gonna happen in the future and then when it gets built, that public space that was supposed to be accessible to everybody or that community facility or amenity just didn't quite make it um, to the degree that it was originally <coughs> promised. Um, first of all, I can assure you that through our relationship with RAL, and with EDC, um, we've confirmed that this team is committed to all of the commitments that we've made so far and any others that we may make as part of this process. But more importantly, we are not waiting for the building to be built to start offering these services. Um, for example, we've already helped help the organization directly behind our building with a database um, cleanup that they needed. Um, we helped the Lower East Side Girls Club with a Salesforce integration. Um, we've been working closely with the Education Alliance to develop a program where students from even the deepest parts of the Lower East Side would be able to have access to technology skills and training. Um, we have been meeting extensively with not only Lesson, but many other Lower East Side groups. First to listen. How, ma how many? Uh, I think it's something around 30 or 40. I, 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 we've, I think we've provided your office with a list. We can provide it again. No, I don't uh, need to listen but, again. I just want you to be able to say how many. Yeah, I th actually, I think it's closer to 60, and now that I come to think of it. Um, 
All right. Uh, yes. It's been so many meetings, but I want to I want to reiterate something that's really important, which is that for us, we want to build. Our theory of change is to build with, not for. You can't create a facility like this without the people directly impacted by it or the people living around it without not being part of the design and build process. And, and I think that Civic Hall wants to do that. And I know that you, you have a 25 year lease and I'm expecting hopefully in 25 years you're retired. But I want to- How about an extension? That we're building, that we're building more of a, a legacy project here that's gonna be able to go on in 25 years. And right now there's only three floors out of the whole building that are committed for 99 years to true workforce development. And yes, I know there's step up spacing. Yes, I know that Civic Hall has floors. But there are only three floors truly committed to the full extent of the lease to the community. So that's why I'm trying to, I'm asking that you consider putting another floor to what I think is supposed to be the true vision behind this project, which is the Digital Skills Training Center. You have Class A office space. You didn't mention how much you're going to charge per square feet, but I'm going to ask you. And then I also want to know how much you're going to charge per square feet for the step-up space and how that's compared to the market in Union Square. Because 1,500 square feet, 2,500, there are a bunch of storefronts all over the neighborhood that are vacant because we have a small business crisis. And so I want to make sure that what you're providing as step-up space, what is the difference between you and WeWork, and what are you going to be providing in conjunction with the city to make sure that these minority and women-owned businesses are thriving? So first off, in terms of the step-up office space, I can tell you, I mentioned to you when we spoke previously, we're anticipating around $60 a square foot for that space. Um, if you're a traditional market space in Union Square that was in a Class A office building by itself um, could be anywhere from $80 a square foot to $100 a square foot in that area, um, depending on the type of building and location and a, a bunch of other factors as well. Um, the step of office here, how it's different than a, a traditional co-working space like a WeWork, is those type of spaces are membership-based organizations where um, I, I think last time I saw it was like 90% of their revenue comes from individual members who basically pay, uh, are charged a membership fee. They come on a daily basis, they can sit anywhere they want within the space. They do have a small portion that's um, dedicated to the types of users we're going for, which is these small companies, but it's a very small portion of their revenue. Um, what we're doing here is we're not having a membership at all. This is going to be short-term leases, six months to five years, and again, the minimum term, that six month term, prevents having any of that membership type, um, membership type uh, person or individual or even company from coming to this space on a short term basis. It's really, and we're also building out the space. So because we're building out the space, it can't, it's never gonna be um, a bunch of desks that are just in the middle of the space. It's always gonna be real offices that are really geared towards those small businesses, called a thousand square feet to 5,000 square feet. And we're anticipating right now having anywhere from five to eight companies per floor that are sharing sharing services such as reception receptionists um, conference rooms uh, lunch areas and what that does it, it helps reduce the overall cost of the space because they're not paying for they're not individually paying for space that now is is shared with other other tenants that are also part of that floor okay i know that my my colleague from eastern queens has a question so i just want to and if you don't mind coming back to me later yeah. when we have time. Not, not a I problem, just, I just want to say one last thing is that, you know, um, you mentioned the construction being contained to the footprint. And so I'm already on record as asking during the L train shutdown for a moratorium of construction on 14th Street. So I'm already on record. I just want to let you know that I, I just think it's, it's going to be too much. It's an unprecedented shutdown. And uh, it's going to be a disaster. But anyway, we're going to work through it, everyone. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, so there's that. I just want to mention that I am on record for that. And in terms of, you know, EDC saying that you could have gone with a smaller project that does not include the, such a critical mass of public benefits, I, I just, I find that unhelpful. I find it unhelpful to say that you could have gone without the rezoning because, you know, so to, to avoid my approval and, and not include as many public benefits, it's city-owned land, and this is 14th Street. We could have had so many things there. And so I, I want to believe in this project, um, and that's why I'm asking so many questions, and thank you for, for being here. Um, I want to get into the urban space after my colleague. I just want to give uh, Council Member Gredenchik a minute uh, to ask what he likes, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Rivera. Um, 
I'm going to turn over to Council Member Grudenchek for a few questions. People from Eastern Queens don't always get heard, so I'm delighted to uh, ask a question or two. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you um, to my colleague, Ms. Rivera. Um, somebody said that Union Square is a hub, and it is indeed a hub, and I've been visiting Union Square uh, since I was a little boy because my father worked at 72 Fifth Avenue. It was always fun to go visit him there, and we used to buy my winter gear at Paragon and all that kind of stuff. So I'm old. I remember those kind of things. But um, I am concerned as a resident of Eastern Queens, my district is borders Nassau County, that maybe we should be pushing more jobs into areas like Long Island City and Astoria and where we have those capabilities because it takes a really, really long time, even with the L train running. I don't have any subway stops in my district, so I don't know from subways. But um, shouldn't we be focusing more on the other areas of the city where people live, where they can get to work in a shorter period of time, and especially something that's as exciting as a tech boom? Um, because we have young people all over the city, and we see them, we see the young people flocking in here. Uh, maybe we want to de-emphasize a little Manhattan in, in favor of some of the other parts. So I'll, I would ask the, the first person who spoke, the uh, Vice President from EDC, to talk about that. You just gave me a promotion. I'm an Assistant Vice President at EDC, <laughs> oh, okay. but I thank you for that and we'll let my colleagues know. Um, EDC is working on many projects to encourage outer borough um, commercial development. And, um, and it's a priority for the city that job growth be spread around um, and opportunities be available to residents across the five boroughs. I think one of the things that really excites me about this particular project is that it is so well located by transit so students from across the city can hop on the subway and get training. We currently have students. It's still a long way. I mean, you know, uh, to get to the subway in my district um, or Councilman Donovan's, does, he does have subways, but it's still, you have to leave an hour and a half. And it's just something that dawned on me. It also seems to me, you know, Union Square has taken on a lot in my lifetime. I've never lived there. My sister lives in Greenwich Village on 9th Street, but um, and she's a constituent. She did vote for you, Ms. Rivera. Um, she's a constituent. <laughs> it's one good entry um, there. But it's just, it, it's, it's just a statement I wanted to make today that I think we should be pushing more of the jobs uh, out into the other areas where people can live and work. One of the great things about some of the other cities that I visit is that you don't have that long commute. New Yorkers, the commute has gotten worse and worse, not EDC's fault, the MTA's fault. Um, and it's gonna be years before we can reverse that. So thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you, Council Member Grudenchek. I'll turn it over to Councilwoman Rivera. Thank you, and I know there are people here to testify, so I, I won't ask you all of my questions, but I know that we have been engaging in a dialogue, and so I look forward to continuing that conversation. So in terms of urban space, can you explain the limitations on the radius and number of locations per, for the potential vendors in the space, and why did you come to kind of that uh, calculation? Um, you mentioned Mikey's Ice Cream, which I think is absolutely an amazing business, and he's wonderful. Um, and can you talk about the other vendors that you've spoken to that you're trying to get in to bring a diverse uh, marketplace? I'll let Emily talk about the different vendors that they're trying to bring yeah. to urban space, and then I can answer some of the questions okay. that we had about the lease restrictions. So when we visited the community board in December of 2015, or in November of 2015, we heard from them that it was important that there not be big box retail at the site. They wanted to see smaller businesses and smaller retail. And so that's um, one of the reasons that we are so excited about Urban Spaces Partnership. And so in thinking about what restrictions we could put in place to prevent a big box store from coming to the site, we included a restriction on the number of locations um, that any tenant who wants to rent space could have to rent space in the building and um, a restriction on the radius so that it wasn't just the same businesses that you're seeing in the area renting space. We really wanted to provide an opportunity for new entrepreneurs to um, try out their products in one of the busiest retail corridors in New York. And I'll let Emily answer the rest of your question. 
urban space, uh, when we go to look for vendors, we look for that local entrepreneur, the mom and pop shop. Uh, I've been a resident of CB3 on and off for the last eight years, and I very much have seen how the neighborhood has changed. And one of the reasons why I went to work for urban space was to connect to those small businesses and to give them a place to grow. When we opened Urban Space Vanderbilt, which is a food hall located in Midtown, uh, we were able to successfully give 20% of our spaces to first-time brick-and-mortar businesses. So these are vendors that we had worked with at our pop-up markets uh, who were really working at local uh, communal kitchen spaces to try something new uh, and found so much success at our pop-ups that we were then able to help them take that next step and grow to a brick-and-mortar space. So we absolutely intend to continue that same style of leasing when figuring out the right vendor mix for this food market. When it comes to the, the local area, do you think that this would be a boost to the other local small businesses in the area? How has it, and how has it worked in other neighborhoods where you've brought large markets in terms of your effect on, on local small businesses and mom and pops? Uh, so I can speak to Mad Square Eats, which is a market we started in 2008 uh, in Worth Square, which is just adjacent to Madison Square Park. Uh, before our first Mad Square Eats, which was in 2008, uh, that Broadway corridor was really quite vacant. Uh, since we've started, almost all of those retail spaces have been leased up, which is exciting to see. Uh, and we have businesses that have expanded into some of those storefronts. Uh, there was, we have had businesses who held food carts uh, that would be adjacent to the market or in the park, and because the market was such a success, they would actually rent space from us uh, when the markets popped up in the spring and the fall. Just in creating that sense of community and drawing a plethora of people to the space, they were able to generate more <laughs> business as a member of our, or as a partner in our market, as opposed to being on their own. In terms of the other jobs on site, um, in, in the spirit of the workforce development project, are the, could you, the developer and, and labor unions, commit to a target of, of local hiring? Uh, I mean, we're, we have spoken with both the Building Trades Council as well as 32BJ about how, um, how to staff the, both the construction and the operation of the building. Uh, from the construction end, uh, there, you know, it's not a massive mega project where it will have this massive creation of jobs, but it will it will uh, draw from local, and it will. We've spoken to the building trades about opening opportunities when there are the job fairs. There could there would be targeted kind of advertisement within the local communities uh, for those opportunities. In addition, um, as it relates to the operation of the building, again, it's not a a massive building to operate. There will be a there will be a, a sizable staff, and um, we will work uh, with 32BJ locally. I think also 32BJ has a huge contingent of, as we saw at some of the community board meetings, um, of of uh, members who are resident are currently residents of uh, community board three and the adjacent community boards, and I think there are opportunities. Um, for those members to potentially seek a job closer to home in our building um, and, and benefit from our operation. To, to be fair, I mean, it's a 21-story building. It's nothing to sneeze at. It's actually the tallest building in the area besides the Zeckendorf Tower. Uh, no. It's actually, I believe it's the third tall, it would be the third tallest building on that block. So you get the bronze. Um, so it's, um, but it's also just from the operation standpoint, um, the building, the, the floors are going to be leased out. You know, Civic Hall will have their operating staff. The building staff, per se, will not be an enormous staff, but we are making every effort to make sure that we are working locally. Um, building staff also, and in our discussions with Lesson, as per the recommendation and just our efforts, um, you know, I think Lesson would like to have an opportunity to, to place people from Community Board 3 there as well. Um, with with the union. So. How many permanent jobs are going to be created? Um, based on our estimates, there will be over 600 permanent jobs created on the site, and based on our lease with the development team, they've committed those jobs to being living wage jobs, and 
filling employment opportunities through the Higher NYC program, which provides access to jobs created by our developments to low-income job seekers throughout the city. And I just, two more, two last things from your testimony, Jillian, now that I have you. Um, one thing was, we mentioned the scholarships, and so I want to see how you're going to work that out. You mentioned RAL is going to be providing scholarships. I want to make sure that we're working with the relevant partners to make sure that, you know, we're not just saying it, that these are going to go to people that could actually use the, the job training. I think our goal is a, a shared goal. The whole reason that we developed this project was so that New Yorkers who are underrepresented in the tech industry can get a foothold in this industry that is growing and providing good jobs. So we are committed to working with you to ensure that the scholarships that RAL is providing will be targeted to those that need the training the most. Because I, I don't think this is a really big ask. I, how much was PC Richards paying to you annually in rent? Uh, that lease was with a different agency, so I'm not sure, but I can get back to you. Sure, because now you're getting 2.3 million, and that'll go up with with the market. So the other thing I want to, the last thing I'll mention, um, and I'll t turn over back to the chair, is that in your testimony, you said that you've met with local stakeholders, you've received unanimous approval with conditions from the community board, the borough president, and CPC. What's not mentioned here is that also in those resolutions are concerns about hyperdevelopment and making sure that we are putting height restrictions so that 21-story and 30-story buildings do not continue to just, you know, continue to be constructed in the area and so I just want to say for the record that in those resolutions from this unanimous approval were concerns about hyper development and making sure that we are keeping the, the community in scale Union Square is an attractive popular neighborhood because of the people that live there and what they have invested financially and emotionally and so I just want to be clear here that there are a lot of people here who are concerned that this building is going to be a catalyst for hyper development and bring in very tall buildings and so I'm hoping that through our conversations and through with the administration whoever is here from the mayor's office that we can make sure that if we're going to put a tech center there that is truly to bring digital skills along with Civic Hall and that is going to bring 600 permanent jobs that we're also looking at the people who are walking on those blocks morning noon and night and so I just want to Thank you for, for everything that you have, um, all the, my questions that you have answered. And I know that we'll be meeting shortly um, after this, this week or next week or whenever. But I just really, really want to emphasize how important it is that we are just not putting a building there. You know, this is going to be an important project, I, th I think, for tech training. But, you know, for $2.3 to go to EDC, you know, you're making money and scholarships and having true step-up space and support for minority and women-owned businesses and making sure that people are getting the jobs that they need, that, that I know is our goal. So um, I just hope that, Ariel, you would consider adding an additional floor, that EDC, you would really have a, 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 I feel like a more productive conversation with me about the scholarships, about what we're providing, and that the administration, wherever you are in this room, that you're gonna be able to talk to me a little bit better about how we're gonna protect the neighboring communities and how we're gonna make sure that SBS and the other agencies that should be on this panel and should be in the meetings with me every time are providing the services that we need to make this tech center not something that's glassy and sterile, but that's something that's truly for the community. So I just want to thank you all, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for all the generous time that you've allotted me today. Thank you, Councilwoman Rivera, and uh, thank you to the panel uh, for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, call the public panel, uh, I just uh, want everyone to, who is testifying to be mindful of the two-minute clock and respectfully request that you keep your testimony within that time frame. The reason for this time frame is so that we can hear from all the stakeholders uh, who came here today. Uh, thank you. Panel is dismissed. Thank you. Toby Bergman, Community Board 2, Terry Kood, Community Board 2, Mai Fong 
Chong, Community Board 3, and Charles Anderson uh, from Assemblywoman Glick's office. Mi Fung, you have to come up. Is anyone here from the Manhattan Borough President's Office? No? Okay, we're going to get started, so if you could just state your name and please adhere to the two-minute clock. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I wasn't called first, just making sure that we're, are we going in a specific order or can I start? Great. Okay. Hi, my name is Charlie Anderson. I'll be uh, reading testimony on behalf of Assemblymember Deborah Glick and uh, State Senator Brad Hoylman. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the East 14th Street and Irving Place Uniform Land Use Review Procedure for the redevelopment of the lot at 124 East 14th. Uh, the proposed project claims to construct the 21-story building we heard about. However, the project area and rezoning proposal abuts a neighborhood that has seen a significant number of losses in affordable housing and community services because of rampant development. Without protections from adjoining, for the adjoining communities, the Euler, this Euler application at hand stands to further erode the community and would contribute to the uh, continued attrition of affordable housing, small businesses, and neighborhood services that have made this community so attractive to the business development that we are discussing today. Uh, moving on to zoning and density, while 14th Street is already a corridor with tall buildings and this proposed development will not be the tallest structure on this block, these permits allow for space to legalize the bulk and density they are seeking. It is emblematic of the development options that many applicants are seeking in the area for commercial office development between Union Square and Astor Place. Without correct zoning protections for the surrounding neighborhoods, long-term residents and existing business owners will suffer. Uh, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to uh, our concluding statements. Um, the mixed-use nature of these communities added to the revitalization of New York scene in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and are the specific drivers that added to the success of Lower Manhattan as an economic engine for New York State. We appreciate that, in my, that EDC is using the, specific, the special permit process to find a legal avenue for the proposal to be built. Furthermore, we support the merits that the project aims to create for New York City and the immediate local community. Despite that, we oppose the disappointing failure to include any contextual landmarking or zoning protections for the surrounding communities and existing residents and businesses. I am shocked then continued to, that the continued strategy of this administration which pits communities against one another by not creating proposals that promote livable communities with ample affordable housing, park space, office space, schools and transportation infrastructure. I am concluding. Finally, without adequate community protections, all positive aspects of this ULURP would be lost, as seen in the previous ULURP south of 14th Street. The recent 550 Washington Street ULURP that passed in 2016 has reverted to an alternative as of right option following the sale of the lot. While the immediate merits of these projects are not, are not congruous, the fear that a provision which would be passed without community input is real. Uh, for these reasons, we, we urge the denial of this application. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, please send my regards to one of my favorite uh, assemblywomen, uh, Assemblywoman Glick. Will do, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mifang Chung. I am chair of Community Board 3's Land Use, Zoning, Public and Private Housing Committee. Um, this, this project stemmed from a direct request from the Community Board for Tech Training to help increase opportunity for our, our residents who need the most help. Community Board 3 uh, has a roughly 25% poverty rate, which is about half, uh, sorry, which is about double the, the national average. Um, we are also the second highest in terms of income disparity in the city. So any project that comes before us, um, we consider not just the immediate area, but the community board um, demographics and needs as a whole. 
um, this project team presented several times to Community Board 3, and we worked together over the course of several months to, um, to improve and increase the bub public benefits in this project, especially to those who are underserved. I won't list all the conditions that uh, we uh, finally uh, agreed to and all the benefits that were outlined earlier, and perhaps my colleagues can go into that a little bit more. Um, I do want to say, though, at each of the land use committees where we heard this project, much of the time, if not most of the time, was, uh, was spent discussing a third and fourth avenue rezoning. Separate meetings were also held to discuss th third, and third and fourth avenue rezoning, and a resolution was passed in support of the rezoning process, which always begins with a study to determine what's appropriate and what will meet the goals of the rezoning. In terms of this specific project, um, we didn't spend a lot of time discussing the specific land use issues, or, or rather uh, major concerns were not really brought up. Um, when we look at land use actions, we always look at the surrounding, surrounding neighborhoods. And we've definitely done that with this proposal, with this project, and I hope that if the city does consider a look at the 3rd and 4th Avenue rezoning, I hope they also look at the surrounding areas um, that would be affected by that rezoning as well. We did vote to support that rezoning, um, but I also want to make sure that the, um, that the uh, needs are being looked at block by block and building by building. Some areas are primarily residential and some areas are quite commercial. And um, we're also adjacent to the fourth largest uh, transit hub in all of New York, Union Square. So I hope um, uh, our community board's um, greatest concerns were affordable housing um, and affordable businesses. Um, we were upset by the proliferation of, uh, of hotels that we've been seeing and a lot of the we, reasons we, we supported. We just need to stick to the two. We have a lot of people testifying today. I understand. Today. Um, so I, I just want to conclude by saying that we, <laughs> if the uh, rezoning is considered, that um, it truly does maximize affordable housing and businesses, and it doesn't just allow for it, and it leverages the existing transit and other resources to make it happen. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, the borough president of Manhattan, uh, Gail Brewer, is here today. Would you like to come in? Thank you, Madam Borough President. Thank you very much. I'm Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. I want to thank Tara Moya and all the subcommittee, and we're all talking about the Tech Hub project. Um, I think you know I chair the Technology Committee in the City Council, so I know a little bit about the topic. It is the fastest growing industry. It has good jobs at high wages. We know that we need training, and particularly in community board number three, um, where there are lots of challenges and need for workforce development and good paying jobs. Um, we surveyed the community board with the community board in 2017 and more than two-thirds of the responses identified technology as something that they need. I think if you go to any tech company, they'll tell you they need workers right now. I believe in Civic Hall. It's an organization that has worked with stakeholders to advance technology for the public good. We call it Civic Tech. Um, and I think they will continue to do so with additional space. And I love that the council member is pushing them to do even more. Uh, this project will have permanent, dedicated workforce development space. It will provide digital skills training to underserved communities. Most of the partners in this space are nonprofit organizations, and they need to provide free or low-cost trainings, which they have promised. We will hold them feet to the fire. And the nonprofit partners in this space will be required to provide tuition scholarships or just free training. Um, 21st century, it's a link to hires with employers working under the same roof and to other organizations and the residents of Board 3 to get a priority. I share the community's concerns, that's why everyone is here, regarding rezoning of the neighboring streets to the north and south of the site. There's a need to take a holistic approach in addressing land use issues in the area. We need stability, we need affordability, while allowing for growth. We support the community board, all the work they've done, the council member in calling on this administration to commit to actions that will result in zoning protections on the avenues, including height limits along Broadway and University Place 
as well as protections for properties located mid-block on surrounding streets. But I want to make sure that the project does go forward because we need these jobs. It's important to the development of our city as a major hub in global technology to make sure that the residents, Board 3 and elsewhere, have access to the opportunities that this industry can provide those jobs, key training. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Borough President. Good morning. I'm Terry Kood, Chair of Community Board 2, which is the board immediately adjacent to this proposed development. I appreciate that CB3's recommendation and that of the Borough President include the necessity for zoning and other protections for the neighborhood and am I in full agreement with that necessity. I'm here today to stress that the neighborhood that will be affected includes the area in CB2 from 4th to 5th Avenues. Um, and uh, thank Councilmember Rivera for including up to 5th in uh, the opening remarks. CB2 has long supported zoning protections for the area, which we also term the Broadway University Corridor, and appreciates the recognition that this project will have both desired and potentially undesirable effects throughout the greater area. The neighborhood is shared by CBs 2 and 3, and the entire area must receive controls to prevent rapid overdevelopment that would irrevocably change a vibrant and so important neighborhood. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Toby Bergman. I'm a member of Community Board 2. Uh, my wife and I own a small mixed-use building on East 10th Street, uh, where we also live. Uh, I was chair of community board two, three years ago when we first passed a resolution in favor of rezoning what we call the uh, Broadway University corridor. Uh, I believe now is the time to get that rezoning done. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the, it's important to understand what's happening. I think when we met with uh, city planning three years ago, uh, they expressed that there were no vulnerable sites with respect to development in the area. That's turned out not to be true, and I think they legitimately uh, misread the uh, massive market change that's happening uh, in Lower Manhattan uh, and in that area in particular. Uh, and the, the, there's a real need for protection. Uh, I want to give one example of why that protection is so important. The building that I, uh, my bedroom, faces a large uh, old building on the corner of 11th Street and Broadway. Uh, that building is going to come down next year and be replaced by a 13-story office building. I have no problems with 13-story office buildings, but the loss that has already happened to that, at that building is a loss of hundreds of small offices, one-room offices, where all different kinds of small businesses had their, uh, had their place. We're losing psychotherapists, uh, writers. Uh, they have no place to go. That building is also home to four antique stores. My block is mostly small antique stores. Those stores can't exist without a critical mass. As soon as they're down to six in the neighborhood, they fail to exist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Um, you're dismissed. Uh, the next panel, uh, we will be calling up Andrew um, Berman. Sam Moskowitz, Ariel Katz, Harry Bobbins, Lucille Kars Carson, Crescen, Crescen, did I say it right? Good morning. Uh, I'm Andrew Berman, Executive Director of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, largest membership organization in Greenwich Village and the East Village. On behalf of our several thousand members, I'm here today to strongly urge the Council not to approve the proposed 14th Street Tech Hub unless it is accompanied by protections for the adjacent and directly affected Greenwich Village and East Village neighborhoods. 
Without such protections, the tech hub will simply accelerate the destruction of these uh, low to mid-rise neighborhoods. Current inadequate zoning and increasing pressure from the expanding tech industry is turning them into an extension of Midtown South and Silicon Alley. We've been asking the city to address these issues for more than three years. We've made clear from the first announcement of plans for the Tech Hub a year and a half ago that unless neighborhood protections were attached, it would greatly exacerbate already serious overdevelopment problems. From the beginning, we've called for neighborhood, and zone, neighborhood zoning or landmark protections to be part of the plan, but the city has consistently refused. The relationship between overdevelopment in this area and the Tech Hub is not in our minds. The real estate press and several developers have pointed to the announced plan for the Tech Hub as spurring new, previously unheard of tech-related development in the predominantly residential neighborhoods to the south, along University Place, Broadway, and the 3rd and 4th Avenue corridors. We are more than willing to accept a Tech Hub on 14th Street, even one larger and more commercial than current zoning allows, but not at the expense of our neighborhoods and not when it is unnecessary to do so. We've proposed reasonable zoning measures that would protect neighborhood character and encourage or require the inclusion of affordable housing, but the city has consistently said no. We have offered a win-win. The mayor has said it's his way or the highway. Please stand with the residents of this neighborhood and vote no on the Tech Hub unless protections for the immediately impacted neighborhoods are included. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Sam Moskowitz from Greenwich Village Society continuing the testimony. Along the University Place and Broadway corridors, current zoning allows 300 to 400 foot tall office, hotel, or condo towers. Such a tower is nearing completion at University Place and 12th Street, sticking out like a sore thumb. An office tower of this scale was planned nearby on Broadway and was only stopped by our successful efforts to get the site landmarked. Nearly a half dozen similar projects are planned or are in motion in this predominantly residential area where few buildings exceed 12 or so stories and most are significantly less. On 3rd and 4th Avenues, developers are encouraged to sidestep the area's existing affordable housing zoning incentives and predominantly residential character by zoning which allows commercial developments 10% larger than market rate residential ones since the affordable housing incentives only apply to residential, not commercial developments. As a result, modest walk-up apartments with rent-stabilized units are being demolished to build 300-plus room hotels, in one case by a developer who is a campaign fundraiser for the mayor and the mayor's appointee to the Economic Development Corporation, the agency behind the Tech Hub. To address this, the University Place and Broadway, we've proposed replacing the current zoning, which has no height limits and no incentives for affordable housing, with new zoning that will not only reduce the allowable FAR, but increase it, albeit modestly, for developments which include affordable housing. We would limit the height of new construction to a maximum of 145 feet, about the height of the tallest buildings in the area. Our proposed zoning is the contextual counterpart of the existing zoning, with affordable housing provisions added. Had this happened already, the luxury condo tower now rising at University Place and 12th Street could have included 30,000 square feet of affordable housing. For 3rd and 4th Avenues, such affordable housing provisions and height limits already exist. There, we're simply, simply seeking to eliminate the loophole through which developers get around the affordable housing incentives and build out of character large-scale commercial developments. We propose lowering the maximum allowable commercial FAR to below that of allowed for residential developments. This would ensure new development remains predominantly residential and the main incentive for avoiding affordable housing provisions is removed. It is these modest but necessary changes we have proposed as mitigation for the Tech Hub, which the city has refused to consider or even seriously discuss. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arielle Cates, continuing the testimony for the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. Thousands of New Yorkers have written city officials in support of the neighborhood protections we have called for, or have specifically said that they must come along with any planned Tech Hub for the area. Additionally, every elected official who represents this area, including Congress Member Carolyn Maloney, Borough President Gail Brewer, State Senators Brad Hoylman and Liz Kruger, Assembly Member Deborah Glick, and of course past City Council Member Rosie Mendez and current City Council Member Carlina Rivera, have all endorsed these neighborhood protections. 
Community boards two and three have both passed resolutions in support of them, CB3 including in its ULARP recommendation on the Tech Hub, as did the borough president. Additionally, a vast array of affordable housing, planning, neighborhood, progressive, and good government groups have come out in support of the neighborhood protections for this area we have been calling for, including the Cooper Square Committee, an affordable housing provider, Fourth Arts Block, a cultural consortium, Good Old Lower East Side, an advocate for low-income neighborhood residents, the Metropolitan Council on Housing, a citywide advocate for tenants and affordable housing, New York Communities for Change, a citywide advocate for underserved New Yorkers, the Lower East Side Power Partnership, a nonprofit seeking to empower individuals and families on the Lower East Side, the East Village Community Coalition, which works to support and sustain the built and cultural character of the East Village, the East Village Independent Merchants Association, which works to create a strong and diverse business environment that sustains the unique character of the East Village, the Lower East Side <coughs> Preservation Initiative, the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, the Historic Districts Council, the Citywide Advocate for Historic Neighborhoods, the Municipal Arts Society, the Citywide Advocate for Sound Planning Principles, Vision Urbana, a youth and senior services provider in Lower Manhattan, Lois Saida Inc., the non a nonprofit that addresses serious economic and social disenfranchisement of poor and low-income Latino residents on the Lower East Side. Coalition for District Alternative, the East Village's Progressive Democratic Club, Village Independent Democrats, Greenwich Village's Original Progressive Democratic Club. All have called for any Tech Hub approvals to include neighborhood protections. We hope you will heed their call. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harry Bubbins. I'll conclude Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation's testimony. This community has worked closely with our council member, Carlina Rivera, in a good faith effort to balance neighborhood concerns with the city's desires and the potential good which could come from the proposed tech hub. As it regards neighborhood protections, it has thus far been a one-way conversation. The zoning plan we have offered is by no means our ideal, but a reasonable alternative designed specifically to address issues like affordable housing and not reduce allowable development at all, but merely ensure that the uses and the heights of new buildings are co compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Apparently, this is a bridge too far for our mayor. We have offered landmarking as an acceptable alternative, which would address some, if not all, of these issues. There, too, we have no seen no substantive progress. We have been engaging in this conversation with the city for years, so the fact that we are here today with so little progress to show for it lies squarely on the shoulders of this administration. It is they who have refused to listen, refused to negotiate, refused to compromise. It has been their way or no way from the beginning, even when the plans we offer address their purported goals of creating affordable housing, which seem much less important to this administration than increasing the profits and development potential of real estate interests. It is the role of the City Council, among other things, to balance the interests of the Mayor with that of local communities, especially on land use issues. We have tried to work with the Mayor from early on in the genuine hopes of achieving a win-win, as we have with other ULERPs. But this time, this Mayor has shown no interest in anything other than serving his interests and those of his campaign donors who are behind the proposed Tech Hub and many of the developments which would benefit from it. Don't sign off on turning Greenwich Village and the East Village into an extension of Midtown South and Silicon Alley. Stand up to the mayor. Stand up for New York City's neighborhoods. Vote no on the proposed tech hub unless the mayor agrees to necessary neighborhood protections. Thank you. Yes. Yep, just push the button? Oh, sorry. yeah, there you go. Uh, my name is Lucille Krasny. I'm a, I'm a proud uh, citizen of the East Village. I'm here uh, because I felt it absolutely imperative to say something in behalf of our communities. I I'm only can, can say thank you, thank you to the wonderful people who have worked so hard to try to pro uh, protect what was left of our community. And I say what is left because I've been there very many years. And it's, it, I will ask that if anybody's interested in being my neighbor, there is a very cute apartment on my block between A and B for a mere $2.2 million. It has three small bedrooms and one bath. But if that doesn't bother you, and the noise on the park doesn't bother you, I would suggest you invest on my block. But this is what's happened to my neighborhood. And I am thrilled to death to have someone like Carlina Rivera uh, helping us protect what's left. And I want to say that to walk down university now is to weep. 
And I go to a therapist because I was hit by a cyclist. That's another thing the city better do something about. I was hit by this, a cyclist. So therefore, I go to a therapist on university, thrilled that it's not on the block with this, with, that's decimated out of that, the look of that, that area. So I thank you all. I thank, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. And just to say I support and love and care about the work that these people are, do, are doing f uh, on my behalf. Thank you very much. Th thank you to all the panelists. Uh, you're dismissed. Uh, the next panel is uh, Sanda Balaban, Ustacio Saldana, Aix, Aixa Torres, Laura Sewell, and Nikisha Evans. Um, whoever would like to go first, you can, um, why don't we start here, you can s state your name. Good morning, my name is Aix Torres, and I am the president of the Alfredi Smith Houses Resident Association Incorporated. On behalf of the 1,926 families of the Alfredi Smith Houses, I'd like to express our support for the Tech Hut on 14th Street. As a resident association, we can only support a few residents with access to computers or classes for learning technology of the future. At this moment, services provided by Persola or other organizations are in other boroughs, and travel can, can be up to two hours. This hub will provide access for some within walking distance, and others, one bus and or train ride away may be the most 30 minutes of travel versus hours. At the end of this, at the end of this means employment for residents who would not have the opportunity or the, finan or the finances to travel two hours for programs like Persola or take advantage of other programs. Thank you for your time. And I like to say that there are other resident leaders from public housing will be sending statements to the committee. I just need the chairman's name. <laughs> and his contact, and they will be sending on behalf of their public housing developments. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll get you the contact okay. before you leave. Uh, good afternoon, morning still. Um, Laura Sewell speaking. I'm the executive director of the East Village Community Coalition. Uh, the Tech Hub and its nonprofit partners promise an attractive package of programming in exchange for the privatization of city land. But this project cannot be considered without addressing the need for zoning protections for 3rd and 4th Avenues, which were excluded from the 2008 East Village rezoning. CB3, community organizations, and a significant number of residents have consistently supported zoning protections along the 3rd and 4th Avenue corridors south of Union Square. We urge the City Council to simultaneously advance the proposed rezoning of this area along with any approval of this project. The recommendations put forth by CB3 do much to ensure that residents and businesses will maximally benefit from what is on offer from the Tech Hub, and we hope that they are well received by the Tech Hub team. The East Village Community Coalition had a productive meeting with the team and looks forward to hearing more about the opportunities on offer for our independent merchants. There is a pressing need for affordable market space for successful small businesses in CB3, which are continually displaced by real estate pressures. Booths in the proposed ground floor retail market could be an attractive option for such businesses. 
but the current programming requirements eliminate merchants who operate shops within 0.5 miles of the Tech Hub project, with an emphasis on new merchants, putting many businesses within CB3 at a disadvantage. EVCC believes including these businesses would be beneficial to both Tech Hub tenants and residents who are familiar with their services, and we have asked the EDC to waive the 0.5 mile requirement for businesses within CB3. There is a pressing need for services that serve residents rather than tourists, which would serve building tenants as well, and we believe an open dialogue among the parties who will be affected by the introduction of this new market space will lead to programming that best serves the project and the community. I'm concluding. We call for responsible planning that serves the needs of the people who live and work here. We ask the council to stand firm on a rezoning of the 3rd and 4th Avenues in any approval of this project. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you for Is this on? Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning in support of the Tech Hub. I'm Sandra Balaban, co-founder of YVOTE and Civics Unplugged. Like many of us, November 8, 2016, changed my life and my trajectory. Having spent 20 years in education and youth development, I took the election season and its denouement very, very seriously, demonstrating as it did the breakdown of civic fabric in our country and the shortcomings of civic education over the last four decades. I felt compelled to leave my job and devote myself to bolstering youth civic engagement and voter engagement. Recognizing that just 36% of 18 and 19 year olds voted in 2016 versus 70% of people over age 70 underscored the vital role that today's young people, our country's largest, most diverse, most progressive generation can play in changing the political ecology. Both of the youth organizations I created addressed deep needs in the youth civic ecosystem, but they didn't address my own needs to be part of a, a civic ecosystem. Thankfully, I discovered Civic Hall and its exemplary organizers and residents program. This program was designed for people like me, people with outsized ambitions and undersized budgets who cannot afford traditional co-working spaces and wouldn't want to. What I've found at Civic Hall is an exemplary community of civic movers and shakers who are truly committed to collaborative learning and to building upon one another's efforts and ideas in order to build a better, more civically-minded city. My work getting not just one but two youth organizations supporting hundreds of New York City youth off the ground would not have been possible without the inspiration that pulses through Civic Hall and the concrete support I've derived from colleagues and allies there. Civic Hall provides space in multiple ways. Concretely, it has provided good central space for our youth from across four boroughs to congregate for planning meetings and events like our May 31st Youth Town Hall with elected officials attended by Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, thank you Gail, two Congress members and two City Council members, thank you Brad Lander and Steve Levin. Beyond physical space, Civic Hall has provided me and countless others with the head and heart space we need to fortify ourselves to take on some of the foremost challenges of our time. I frequently welcome non-Civic Hall members into the space for meetings and every one of them notes how energized and inspired they are to be in the space and how it gives them an enhanced sense of possibility. What do we need more these days than an enhanced sense of possibility? I urge you to support Civic Hall in expanding its footprint and continuing to expand possibilities. Many, many thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Eustacio Solania and I'm the Director of Operations for New York Tech Alliance. Our mission is to represent, inspire, support, and help lead the new New York technology community and ecosystem to create a better future for all. We also run the world's largest meetup group, the New York Tech Meetup, with over 58,000 members. A centralized tech center and expanded civic call will not only allow programs like our monthly meetup to thrive, it will also foster the partnerships and connections necessary that will enable organizations like ours to be successful. It is our goal that our members, which include students, those in career transition, uh, beginning entrepreneurs and tech professionals from all five boroughs to learn, volunteer, and engage. And having a central tech center like Civic Hall will only encourage continued growth of tech with all New Yorkers in mind. Hello, my name is Nikki Evans, and I am here on behalf of CUNY, um, speaking in support of the Tech Training Center at Union Square. I'm the director for the CUNY Office of Workforce Partnerships, and I'm responsible for several of our university-wide tech initiatives on both the academic and workforce development side of the house. 
For the past four years, CUNY has worked hard to expand education and training access in the tech space to New York City residents, including winning a four-year, $6 million US DOL training grant that allows us to provide training access to um, residents in Manhattan, Queens, and in Brooklyn. We see this opportunity presented by the Tech Training Hub as a great chance to continue to expand on the work that we are currently doing on bo in both the degree programs and on the workforce side. Honestly, one of the main things that this um, opportunity provides is space. Space is at a premium in New York, off offering training programs, offering the time and the energy needs a house for that. And this particular opportunity gives us that and allows us to offer more training programs. You're right, there are a ton of training programs in the city, but given the size of the city, we need more. Also, it offers us a, a deeper connection to the local startup community. New York City's tech industry is really being driven by its startups, understanding how they're developing, how they're growing, allowing those who are taking training programs to see where their skills can actually fit and not having that separated. Um, into just a regular classroom is very helpful, not only for helping them see what types of jobs they can have and what the future does hold for them, but what kind of jobs they can build and what kind of companies they can build and where they can be. So uh, speaking on behalf of CUNY, we are in support of this wonderful opportunity and we hope that the City Council will be in support of the Tech Hub at Union Square. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, the next panel. We have Richard um, Bolt, Blodgett, Ann Mitchell, David Rosen, uh, former councilwoman uh, Rosie Mendez is here, and Barbara uh, Goru. Kayu, Kayun, you know how you say this one? Kayunia. Kayunia. Sorry, sorry. On behalf, of On behalf of the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. Jean Cryer. Yeah. We'll start over here. Thank you. If you could just state your name. Yes. Uh, good morning. It's still morning. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Richard Blodgett. I'm a longtime resident of Greenwich Village. I do not oppose Tech Hub per se. Creating jobs in the tech industry is a very noble objective. However, the preservation of our city's residential neighborhoods is equally noble and should not be ignored. Please look for yourself at the area south of Tech Hub. Walk its streets if you have not already done so you will find a wonderful, friendly, vibrant neighborhood that has survived for many years. New York City and its people thrive on neighborhoods like this. Yet, this neighborhood is being threatened by outsized development. The pressure for large, inappropriate development will only increase if Tech Hub is approved. Job creation is great, but not at the cost of destroying a residential community. If you approve Tech Hub, please provide zoning or landmark protections for the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you. Councilwoman. Uh, former Councilwoman. You always and have the title. It's been uh, seven months and it's an honor to come back into chambers and be in front of my Councilwoman, uh, Carlina Rivera. Um, I, I am here because this issue is very important to me. 
and I am against this project if protections are not put in place for our communities in community boards two and three from Third Avenue to Fifth Avenue. I want to let you know, Mr. Chair, that this project came to me in 2014. Then HDC and EDC came forward with a housing uh, project. And I ran on community-based planning. It's still the principles I abide by. I certainly want that as part of the community. And, um, and I told them to go back to, to go to community board three, but I would not commit to anything until after the community board had made a decision. They went to community board three, and then they changed the project to this tech hub, which I'm not against jobs, but not at the expense of people losing their homes, uh, buildings being demolished, and having oversized buildings that are not in scale with the community, and losing uh, and having our rent stabilized tenants be displaced. So that is why we need the protections. So the city and the agencies went to community board three, never told them that there was a housing uh, option, and they met with the economic development committee of community board three for several years planning this out. When people from community board three realized, well, when I found out I at some point knew there was a tech hub plan. I always thought there was a housing component because my neighborhood always wants housing and we need it. Um, when I told them that housing was an option, that committee never knew that housing was an option, but they felt that they had gone down this road and invested so much and they would like to see housing, but they were gonna continue to support the project. So I am here to say it's a worthy project not at the expense of the residents who have lived there for a long time, not at the expense of my neighbors, and um, we need protections put in place, and if we get that, uh, we'll all be better off. One last thing, um, my, can I have one more minute? My mm -hmm. land use director um, at the time, Please help me out with his name. I'm having a moment. Matt, Matt Vigiano. Vigiano. Shout out. Yeah. Matt Vigiano and I walked that area of the district that we're proposing be contextually rezoned, block by block, avenue by avenue. We came up with 12 scenarios in which out of scale development could happen through assemblages. Department of City Planning said, under good planning principles, this cannot happen maybe, maybe in two of your scenarios, but not in these 12. Since then, four are developed or are being developed. I fear eventually all of 12 sites will be developed, and there are other scenarios where you could, we did use some good planning principles because he's an urban planner, um, and that more than 12 sites can be developed. It will be very dangerous for our community it will change, and we will lose a lot of long-term residents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I know that uh, Councilwoman Rivera has a question. Yeah, I, Rosie, uh, Councilwoman, it's very good to see you. Thank you for being here. And I, wa I was gonna ask about that exact tour that you took of Broadway and all of the sites that DCP said would not happen, and you just confirmed that at least four of the 12 are in development or are developed. And can you also speak to um, your concern at the time of the transfer of existing development rights above some of the buildings there, for example, Grace Church? You know, um, air, air rights needs, you know, when you're transferring air rights to me, it's, it's something we need to look at. I've opposed certain housing developments for affordable housing because the air rights were not being controlled. And um, currently, and in many of these projects that did uh, take place in my then district, um, that HPD renovated uh, affordable housing and air rights was created. Those air rights went to scrupulous developers who have harassed tenants, who have done 
construction by harassment. And, you know, they should not benefit from air rights. There's a very good purpose to air rights, and there should be some kind of screening so that if you have a lot of violations in your buildings, if you've been harassing people and there's been complaints, you should not benefit from getting these air rights. Um, and so, you know, uh, I think that, that the answer to your question is, air rights is not a bad thing, it depends who's getting them, and the city has not put any mechanism in place to weed out unscrupulous developers from getting their hands on these air rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara Gorin. I'm a, a neighborhood resident at uh, 10th Street and University Place. And uh, especially over the last 10 years, we've watched the character of University Place changing. We've lost many, many local businesses and uh, uh, that have served uh, residents. We've lost shoemakers and hardware stores and mom and pop pharmacies and um, two beloved local restaurants that have been there for decades, um, all under uh, increasing overdevelopment pressure. Um, the neighborhood is already under a lot of pressure because of NYU and Union Square activity. Um, and with uh, the tech hub, um, this pressure would only increase. We've all seen what um, uh, tech hubs in Seattle, Palo Alto, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and other places have done to their surrounding neighborhoods. Um, uh, there are no incentives for private developers to build in a contextual manner and to include low income and affordable housing in the absence of zoning requirements. And I say this as a lawyer currently representing hundreds of low income residents who have been forced out by um, harassment by private developers. Uh, um, so this development is an example. It's going to replace a two-story building with a 21-story building that has no housing, um, no certainly no affordable or low-income housing, which only increases the necessity of adding protections for the, the rest of the neighborhood. Um, um, it would just be a tragic shame to, to allow the unique character of Greenwich Village and the East Village, south and west of the Tech Hub, uh, to, um, to deteriorate any further. Uh, and I thank especially Councilwoman uh, Rivera uh, and others who um, have proposed sensible approaches to the Tech Hub, including zoning protections. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Jean Creer. I am one of your constituents, uh, Councilwoman Rivera. I live on 4th Avenue and 12th Street, essentially in the backyard of the Tech Hub, just two blocks south of it. And with me here are four of the residents of our building on which I have the pleasure of serving on the board. And behind me, if you can imagine this, are at least 59 of us who, Councilman Rivera, when you were campaigning, I presented a petition to you with our 59, at that time we call us the 59 Club, 59 signatures of people in our building who are deeply, deeply concerned about the prospect of, as the word you just said today, hyperdevelopment in our neighborhood and all of what that impact is. I also presented that petition to the mayor at his town hall, after which actually one of his press people grabbed me and said, do you want to have a picture with the mayor? And I was scooped up under his gigantic six and a half foot tall arm and he is smiling with our petition. Sadly, the mayor has not been, as the representatives from GSV, GVSHP have just said, responsive to our terms and our requests about zoning in our neighborhood. Nor have any of the previous mayors, for that matter, who have declined the GVSHP's efforts to protect that neighborhood with zoning or landmark protection. If you imagine the little slip of aisle in this room and think of all of this as Greenwich Village, east and west, that precious strip of land is where we live and where now, within four blocks of us, we have seen 
300 foot tall buildings or 300 size rooms, hotels going up. So listen, one last point and I'm watching the time. 59 of us have signed our petition. There are many, many thousands of other residents who are also equally concerned. 59. 59 is the number of people on this half of the room. It is also the number of lots in this area that are unprotected upon which a gigantic building will go if we don't have the zoning protection. That's really serious. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you, Councilman Rivera, our former one, and everybody at GVSHP. This is really vitally important, and we care and we appreciate all you'll do to say no to this unless it has the zoning protection we need. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kene West, and I wanted to thank you for allowing me to testify on behalf of the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. Dear City Council members, a year and a half ago, five historic buildings on East 11th Street were demolished, and longtime residents were pushed out to make way for a giant hotel. About 12 to 13 years ago, on 12th Street between 3rd and 4th Avenue, most of a historic church was torn down. In a cynical gesture to the community outcry, its front facade was retained as an ornament for the ugly 26-story NYU dorm tower that now rises like a big middle finger saying screw you to the community that rightfully opposed it. A few blocks down on 8th Street at 51 Astor Place, a big, fat, freakishly out-of-scale office building went up recently. Nicknamed the Death Star, it is sucking the air and light out of the Astor Place area. Since the tech hub seeks to locate in this low-rise neighborhood because of its historical, cultural, and architectural dynamism, the city should see the proposed zoning protections as appropriate and beneficial to both the community and the tech hub folks themselves. Sensible cities like Paris do not allow tall towers to invade historic neighborhoods, and they certainly would not approve this project unless they first made sure that the neighborhood was first protected. If the city does not enact sensible contextual zoning protections, real estate developers will bury this area with more eyesore towers of glass and steel and a hyper gentrification that will displace residents, small businesses, and the historic character of the community. Please approve the 3rd and 4th Avenue rezoning protections before it's too late. Thank you. On behalf of President David Mulkins. Thank you. Thank you to the panel for your testimony today. Uh, we will be calling up the next panel, uh, Stephen Mott, Brian Glover, Brittany Spatz, Megan Joy, and John Montez. She was fine. Can can you just all briefly state your name, so we know what? Yeah. Yeah. Brittany Spatz. Megan, Megan Joy. Okay. Brian Glover. John Montez. Okay. Uh, no, Stephen Mott. No. Okay. And Mike McDermott. started. Good morning. My name is Brittany Spatz and I'm here on behalf of Educational Alliance to support our, to express our support of the Tech Hub on 14th Street, acknowledging the game-changing opportunities that this new center will provide our students, families, and staff members. At we, as we at Educational Alliance continue to meet the ever-changing needs of the 50,000 New Yorkers who walk through our doors each year, we rely on cutting edge partners like Civic Hall to help us ensure that all members of our community receive the resources, training, 
access and opportunities that they need to achieve their goals. We recognize that this hub can provide critical technical support for our staff, ensuring that we and other local nonprofits can effectively use digital tools that allow us to track, aggregate, visualize programmatic data, information that's critical to improving our services and maximizing our impact. We recognize that this space has the potential to serve our over 2,000 students, some of the most at-risk youth in our city, fostering 21st century skills that will prepare them to attain high-level jobs, jobs that can break the cycle of poverty. And finally, because of the hub's emphasis on civic engagement, we recognize that the families we serve, many of whom are immigrants, will be able to access resources and tools to enable them to step into local leadership roles in new and powerful ways. When I began working on the Lower East Side, I ran Educational Alliances program at PS188, where 100% of my students were receiving free or reduced lunch, and almost half of them were considered homeless. The thought that in a couple of years, these students, my students, will be able to hop on the M14D and in just a few minutes be connected to world-class instruction, networks, mentors, and previously untouchable professional opportunities, that is incredible. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Joy, and I chair the Economic Development Committee on Community Board 3. Um, sorry about that. It's okay. That. You can, um, no, no, you, you're good. <laughs> while we often speak about the struggles about, of small businesses in our neighborhood, um, I think it's important that we also focus on what are the larger uh, economic drivers um, in the next 20 years. All signs of that are pointing to tech. Um, our district has the second amount of public housing than any other district in the neighborhood. Um, and it is increasingly becoming a city of haves and have nots. And we have to make sure that our most vulnerable citizens have access to the opportunities it takes to succeed in this industry. Um, Community Board 3 has specifically asked for a business incubator in our last two district need statements. And we thank the city for delivering on that ask. EDC, RAL, and Civic Hall have presented to our board at least five times. And while many of those meetings were dominated by the Third and Fourth Avenue, Third and Fourth Avenue rezoning conversation, when we finally got to consider the project itself, we were pleased with what we heard. That said, this is city-owned land, and who is the city? We are the city, and when we lease our land to private developers, we have to make sure that it's beneficial to the majority. So while the developers had many benefits to the communities, it's our job to ask for more. Some of the stipulations that Community Board 3 put in our resolution in support of this tech hub, and I won't name them all because there's a lot, but is one additional floor of workforce development um, space that the basement level be leased out to a theater or a community use, that there be additional scholarships for workforce development, that there's free event space for the community. And we would be naive to think that a development of this size would not have an impact on the greater neighborhood. And while there are current high caps in the, in the 3rd and 4th Avenue rezoning, it may not be enough. So CB3 has also asked the city to commence the process of a rezoning of 3rd and 4th Avenue while incentivizing affordable housing and possibly excluding hotels and big box retail. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brian Glover with Community School District 1. I'm here on behalf of Superintendent Carrie Chan. Uh, to talk to you guys about how Civic Hall has been working with us already uh, on the education side in our district. Um, as you know, we have a new vision for learning in District 1 that's really focused on our core values of equity and collaboration and innovation and bringing joy back to learning. And part of that is also helping our learners uh, empow become empowered with more agency and voice. Um, Civic Hall has been trying to help us realize this vision They've already spent time with our Young Men Exploring Mentoring Group, which was taking place at PS15 at the end of the last school year between Avenue C and D on 4th Street. Um, they were there to mentor our young men of color from our middle schools at PS34, 188, and 140. They've also been meeting with the district team so that we can deepen our work in partnership together. 
They've offered to host our principals conferences and our modern learning advisory group at the current Civic Hall location in Chelsea. Um, they came out to present to our school leaders at our end of year principals conference and we're already developing learning opportunities for both school leaders and school staff with Civic Hall as a partner. Um, the future feels like it's looking a little bit brighter in our district, knowing that this technology hub is going to be available for our students, our families, and for our schools. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael McDermott. Thank you for having me. I'm a resident of the East Village, where I have lived for the past 29 years. I'm also a member of Local 46 Iron Workers, and amazingly, I recently retired. I'm here to speak in favor of RAL's application for 124 East 14th Street. Uh, I have a couple of points here. We can fulfill local hiring requirements gladly. Middle class jobs only union can provide. Local 46 really needs work right now. I respect my neighbors' feeling about this project, but we need good development and good jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Montez. Uh, I'm currently a resident of Jacob Reese Housing. Oh, uh, I live on 12th Street Avenue D. Uh, prior to that, I, I used to live on uh, by the seaport, South Street. Um, and from there, I, uh, from way back then, I used to work as uh, in fast food um, at Popeyes, making minimum wage, which was 7.25 at the time. Later on, uh, later on, um, I got an internship, but it only went up to 10, uh, to 10 dollars an hour. Um, from there, I went to Perscolis. Uh, Perscolis actually helped me in gaining uh, in gaining uh, technical. Uh, technical knowledge and things of that nature. Uh, I picked up my A plus and net plus certifications. Um, and from the, 10, uh, from the $10 an hour I was making with the internship, I bumped up to a $50,000 a year salary. Um, with that, with that um, I'm also planning on moving forward. I've picked up two more certifications. And I believe that having something, having a place like Priscola's close to home in Manhattan would be beneficial to a lot of the people in my neighborhood because over on 12th Street and Avenue D, uh, I noticed that a lot of people are a lot of people are struggling when it comes to when it comes to um, jobs and financial things of that nature. And Perscolis being all the way in the Bronx was very hard to reach. Um, I, I myself was actually unable to make it for a final test for Python. Uh, which is a coding language, um, because of my asthma, and that distance was too great for me. Um, having a, having resources like uh, like that close to home would really would really benefit in the growth of the community financially, and I think that uh, that would probably be the best thing for my neighborhood. Thank you, thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, the next panel. Uh, will be Kathleen uh, Wake, Wakeham, Wake, Wakeham, uh, Ray Rogers, Zachary Lerner, uh, Tom Bichard, and Eric Raymond. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Wakeham from the Metropolitan Council on Housing. I have lived in the community of the proposed tech hub for over 40 years on East 12th Street. Across from the post office on East 11th Street and 4th Avenue, there is a construction site because five 
rent-stabilized buildings were demolished to make room for a moxie hotel. Around another corner on East 14th Street between First Avenue and Avenue B, there are other construction sites for upscale buildings that displaced rent stabilize tenants and small business owners. As I walk through the neighborhood that I love because of its vibrancy of immigrants, political activists, artists, bohemians, I see a rich culture being taken away by greedy developers who are tearing at the fabric of our community. Also, our neighborhood is becoming unaffordable. According to CAF and NA, HD. In Community Board 3, the median household income is $42,268, and 50.5% of tenants are rent burdened. They pay more than 50% of their income for rent. The present proposal for the Tech Hub will make our community more unaffordable, as rent-stabilized apartments are demolished for hotels and condos, and high-end stores and retail chains replace small business owners. I am asking Mayor de Blasio and the City Council to support rezoning protection as proposed by former council member Rosie Mendez, the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, and others living in the community. This proposal would stop oversized development, protect the residential character of the area, and protect and create affordable housing. A vote in support of the Tech Hub without such protections will be a vote for the overdevelopment and destruction of our neighborhood and for building 300-foot-tall high-rise luxury condos, tech offices, and hotels rather than appropriately scaled buildings and decent affordable housing, as well as protect such housing and small business owners. I urge you to take action on this very important issue to preserve the heritage of our neighborhood, to protect our homes, and to protect and create much needed affordable housing. Thank you to Council Member Carlina Rivera for your support and to the City Council for holding this hearing. Hi, okay. Ray Rogers. I wrote a letter to the editor that appeared in the Daily News under the heading, One City Under Rebney. Rebney stands for the Real Estate Board of New York, or more appropriately, for the real estate bullies of New York ravaging every borough of New York City. Rebney's rezoning policies dictated to the mayor, Economic Development Corporation, and City Department of Planning are causing extreme hardship on and massive displacement of longtime residents and small businesses. Rebney's rezoning policies are leading to the bulldozing of our community gardens, historic buildings, libraries, schools, and hospitals to make way for more super tall luxury high rises, large hotels, malls, and absentee landlords. Our political leaders must not facilitate but must stop Rebney from running roughshod over New Yorkers. While I admonish the mayor, I applaud political leaders, Congressman Maloney, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, Assemblyman Harvey Epstein, and Council. Members Ben Kalis, Jamani Williams, former City Council member Rosie Mendez, and yes, you, Carlina Rivera, Congresswoman Carlina Rivera, who I'm happy to have my picture on my website with you, uh, for standing to show, to have the guts to stand up to Rebney. All of you are on the website, stoprebneybullies.org, holding up this leaflet that says, Beware of Rebney, Real Estate Bullies Plague in New York. Why I'm here today is I've come to support the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation uh, and reasonable position that the tech hub must be human scale and include neighborhood protections. Thank you. And thank you, Carlina. Thank you, council members, for inviting us to share testimony today. My name is Zachary Lerner, Labor Organizing Director for New York Communities for Change. We're a community organization representing over 20,000 low to moderate income New Yorkers across the five boroughs in Long Island. Uh, we are here today to urge the City Council to vote no on the Union Square Tech Hub proposed by RAL Development. As folks know, we are at a serious crisis right now here in the city. The tale of two cities is only getting worse. Poverty still continues to be concentrated in neighborhoods that have suffered from disinvestment for decades. Areas like Brownsville and Mott Haven still have over twice the unemployment rate as the citywide average. The Union Square Tech Hub, with no targeted component and only a best faith effort to reach marginalized communities, will do little to solve this problem. 
We need more and better jobs in New York City. Right now, the jobs that are available to people from places like Mott Haven and Brownsville are often minimum wage jobs or precarious jobs like driving for Uber. This type of work makes it almost impossible to provide for a family or even see them at all because of the hours you have to work. It makes it impossible to find housing you can afford, buy healthy food, or live a stable life. Last year, Mayor de Blasio unveiled New York Works, a plan to create 100,000 jobs. But who are these jobs actually targeted to? The plan focuses primarily on giveaways of public resources, tax breaks, air rights through uh, rezoning, through rezoning incentives, and land to a handful of growth industries, including tech. The tech industry is notorious for a lack of racial and gender diversity. According to a recent Bloomberg article, just 1% of Facebook and Google technical workers are black. New York, New York Works relies on things like the Tech Talent Pipeline and other training programs as an attempt to correct this problem, but there's a severe lack of investment in these things, such as targeted or local hiring in communities with the highest poverty rates and unemployment. Um, our members have gone through the Tech Talent Pipeline and have been unable to find work in the tech industry despite having completed the required tests and coursework. To tackle the vast income inequality we are seeing here in the city, we should not be giving away our valuable public resources to private developers and companies unless it really benefits the marginalized communities that need it most. The Union Square Tech Hub currently represents an egregious giveaway of public resources with little to no local benefit in return. Land like this, uh, land like this should be used to reduce the disproportionately high un unemployment rates that black and brown youth in New York City face. It should be used to reduce unemployment in the parts of the city where people continue to struggle to make a stable life. The council should not approve the Union Square Tech Hub rezoning unless there is a written commitment by Civic Hall for 75% of all the slots for the training programs that should be designated for low-income New Yorkers. Um, and then targeted hiring, where 60% of the jobs that are being created must be to the communities that need it the most. So we are also in a housing crisis, and the council should vote no unless there are common sense protections put in place in the area south of Union Square to protect the affordable housing in the area and not exasperate the already high rents. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Burchard, longtime owner of Veselka Restaurant on 2nd Avenue and 9th Street. Um, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. Um, my wife, Sally Haddock, is uh, the founder of St. Mark's Veterinary Hospital, which was the first veterinary hospital to open in the East Village and is still uh, the, the largest uh, uh, vet hospital in the East Village. Sally and I raised three children in the neighborhood. We have a very large stake in the East Village, and um, uh, honestly, we love it there. But we feel increasingly concerned about the rapid pace of the escalating pace of development that we see, especially on Third Avenue, Fourth Avenue, um, and University Place. Um, we. Again, we, we, we love the neighborhood. We feel like we have a large stake there. Uh, some time ago, I started hearing the, the neighborhood described as Midtown South, and um, uh, uh, tech, and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a silicone, silicone Alley. I came to the neighborhood in almost 50 years ago and had the good, good luck, the good fortune to um, meet my father-in-law, start working at Baselka, and fell in love with the neighborhood. I have to say, though, that at this point, I, my family and I don't want to live in, in, um, in Midtown South. We want to try to preserve all the things that we love about the East Village, but we're very concerned. So I want to thank you, Councilman Rivera, for, for standing up for us. I, I was very impressed with your opening statement. I appreciate the fact that you articulated uh, very strongly our, our concerns, and I would encourage you, implore you, to fight as hard as you can to, to, um, to bring uh, protections to our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Uh, my name is Eric Raymond. I'm uh, a 30 year resident uh, of the uh, village. My wife is here. Um, we live on 13th Street. In fact, we used to shop at PC Richards. <laughs> um, no one else has mentioned it, but it was a place where you could actually buy physical products uh, and take them home <laughs> or have them delivered by a guy with a pushing them as opposed to uh, through the internet. Mm -hmm. um, 
I would like to commend all the speakers and Councilperson Rivera who have eloquently championed the importance of linking the tech hub to the reasonable zoning and, and uh, uh, historic preservation uh, re, uh, proposals of the Greenwich Village Society of Historic Preservation. I wanted to think of something to add to this um, uh, presentation today, and people have said so many uh, great things. So particularly for the staffers, who I, I believe these people are staffers and uh, of the city council, I think the it should be required reading to read the cover story in last month's Harper's Magazine, written by New York historian Kevin Baker. Mm -hmm. And let me just read the first paragraph of that story. It's um, called The Fall of New York and the Urban Crisis of Affluence. New York has been my home for more than 40 years. From the year after the city's supposed nadir in 1975, when it nearly went bankrupt, I have seen all the periods of boom and bust since then. But I have never seen what is going on now, the systematic, wholesale transformation of New York into a reserve of obscenely wealthy and the barely here, a place increasingly devoid of the idiosyncrasy the complexity, the opportunity, and the roiling excitement that makes a city great. As New York enters the third decade of the 21st century, it is in imminent danger of becoming something it has never been before, unremarkable. It is approaching a state where it was no longer a significant cultural entity, but the world's largest gated community, with a few cupcake shops here and there. So I commend this article to you, and I support the linkage that has been proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, we'll be calling the next panel. Pat Purcell. Irene Liu. Kyle Den 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 Denton. Denton. Kyle, yeah. uh, Kristen Rouse, Abigail Edgecliffe uh, Johnson, Please state your name for the record, and you may begin. Uh, Patrick Purcell, Executive Director. Put, you have to push the button to. This one right here? That one right That's there. The one that just made me a lot louder. <laughs> uh, Patrick Purcell, Executive Director uh, for the Laborers. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Purcell. I'm the Executive Director of Greater New York Laborers Employers Cooperation and Education Trust, Greater New York Lesson. The Labor Management Fund of the Mason Tenders District Council, representing 15,000 hardworking uh, members and 12,000 signatory contractors. Thank you, Chairman Moya, uh, for the opportunity to uh, testify here today before the Council in support of the proposed development on 14th Street and Irving Place in Manhattan by developer RIL. And also to Council Member Rivera, thank you so much for uh, the attention and, and seriousness that you take this. It's much appreciated by everybody. <coughs> Uh, RAL has a long history of building in New York City, and throughout that history, they have always put the needs of the community and the working people first. They have consistently honored their commitments and provided good paying, safe jobs for countless New York City residents on projects throughout the city. As we look to the future and prepare for the, this project on 14th Street, we know that they will continue their record of responsible development. Working hand in hand with RAL, our training school and programs like non-traditional employment for women, helmets to hard hats, Edward J. Malloy Initiative for Construction Skills, and Pathways to Apprenticeship, we can increase our opportunities for local residents in construction and provide a real pathway to the middle class for hundreds of individuals in the Community Board 3 through this project. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and we urge the City Council to approve this land use application. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you may proceed. Thank you, honorable council members. My name is Kyle Danto, and I'm speaking here today as a member of Housing Advocacy Group Open New York to express my concern regarding the proposal uh, that approval of the Tech Hub be made contingent on downzoning 3rd and 4th Avenues in the village to prohibit large hotels <clears throat> and cap the height of residential buildings. I urge the Council to instead consider an alternative rezoning under the mandatory inclusionary housing law to prevent displacement and build homes for some of the most marginalized New Yorkers in this high opportunity neighborhood. As someone who was born right on 14th Street and grew up in Greenwich Village, I value and cherish this community, but at the same time, I value and feel that it is necessary to have inclusion and diversity. For decades, we have seen residents of wealthy neighborhoods use exclusionary zoning to keep their communities and their schools segregated, causing a housing shortage that has affected us all, but has put low-income individuals and low-income communities at the greatest peril. Job creation today far outpaces home building, and it is this imbalance that is the driving force behind gentrification. If we fail to build more homes in the village and elsewhere, the white collar empl workers employed at the Tech Hub may very well move to places like Harlem, Crown Heights, and the South Bronx, displacing tenants and transforming these communities through gentrification. Absent new hotels, Tourists will stay in Airbnbs in places like the Lower East Side and the East Village and potentially taking up rent-stabilized housing. If our goal is to empower tenants and not just wealthy homeowners, we must allow for new affordable housing to be built near jobs and transit and reducing pressure, reduce pressure on gentrifying neighborhoods, that leaves, uh, gentrifying neighborhoods that leaves tenants at the mercy of predatory landlords. The solution must be building more mixed-income housing in neighborhoods like this one, opening up opportunities for people that would otherwise be shut out of the jobs and housing markets. This was the driving idea behind a mandatory inclusionary housing law, and we should take advantage of, of it now. I thank you for your, your consideration. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Irene Liu, and I'm with the Community Service Society of New York, an organization that advocates for the upward mobility of low-income New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to share a perspective on the city's proposed Union Square Tech Training Center. My testimony today will be focused on the potential and need for this project, especially in expanding access to local tech jobs among underrepresented groups who have been left out of the city's booming tech sector. We need a more equitable and inclusive approach to growing New York City's tech force. Combined, blacks and Latinos represent just 18% of the New York City tech workforce, although they make up 43% of workers in non-tech related industries. Furthermore, just 29% of the city's tech workforce is comprised of native New Yorkers, and 30% of the New York City tech workforce lives outside of the five boroughs. Few tech workers are commuting from high poverty communities of color. We believe that the Union Square Tech Hub holds enormous potential for addressing some of the inequity and diversity challenges within the city's tech industry that I've just outlined. By partnering with nonprofit workforce development providers and offering scholarships that help offset the cost of digital skills training programs, the Tech Training Center can enable a broader range of New Yorkers to develop the skills that they need to connect to good paying jobs in the tech industry. However, we also recommend that the city should provide publicly available data on the demographic composition of students participating in the training programs, as well as outcomes data on program completions, job placements, salaries, job quality, and job retention. We need to ensure that the Tech Training Center is serving and benefiting underrepresented groups, especially those with low incomes, NYCHA residents, women, people of color, disconnected young adults, and other marginalized groups. The reporting process should also include data on the demographic profile of for-profit tech corporations and startups that will occupy workspace within the Union Square Tech Hub, as well as metrics on their training and hiring practices. Space should not be leased to tech firms who fail to demonstrate an intention or willingness to invest in job training and hiring of local residents or marginalized workers. We urge the council to implement a formal reporting process for the Tech Hub if it moves forward in approving the Union Square Tech Training Center. Thank you. Hi, I'm Abigail Edgecliff Johnson. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker, a mom of two public school kids, and a founder of Racia, a startup here in New York City that makes race cars that help kids learn science and engineering. Uh, for the past two years, I've been a um, scholarship recipient at Civic Hall, 
Um, and so I wanted to speak in support of their um, proposal. Um, and I just also want to say that, you know, as a woman starting my first company in New York City and changing careers, it's been hugely beneficial for me to have the kind of community that Civic Hall brings to, you know, the, the kind of tech sector, right? Because there are tech hubs and then there are tech hubs. And the kind of community that Civic Hall attracts is this incredibly sort of diverse, amazing, grown-up community of people who are working on real problems. And a lot of people there are on their kind of second and third careers like myself. And so the people that you meet when you are working in these collaborative spaces are just a totally different caliber of people, right? You get people who are teachers and veterans and activists and technologists who can really move your learning and your business and your ideas forward in a way that sort of traditional tech hubs that I think one of the other women was talking about in kind of Seattle, I think don't, right? And I think that's what's so great about Civic Hall is that they are very intentional about the kind of communities that they build and the kind of people that they attract and the way that they are incredibly inclusive about building those kinds of communities um, and, and making sure that you get people from all different walks, you know, people like me who are a mom starting her first company. Um, so, uh, and also just that I've been in a lot of other uh, co-working spaces and they're not like this. And this is really a special and incredible place. And I think the more room you can give to Civic Hall and the kind of communities they build, the more room you give New Yorkers to really grow. So thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Rouse, president and founding director of the New York City Veterans Alliance, a grassroots organization that often testifies in these chambers, pushing our city government to make New York City a better place for veterans and our families. I'm here to testify in support of the Union Square Tech Hub and specifically in support of Civic Hall, which has made the work of the New York City Veterans Alliance possible. I'm a United States Army veteran. When I returned home to New York City after my third tour of duty in Afghanistan, I felt lost. I felt like my life was on track. Civic Hall is what got my life back on track and what allowed me to find a renewed sense of purpose. Civic Hall is much, much more than a co-working space. It's given me the training, the skills, the tools, and most importantly, a, a vibrant and supportive community uh, that has enabled me not just to found an organization, build it, and invite my organization and community into a space, it's also inspired me uh, not just to make New York City a better place for veterans and families, but to be part of a larger movement to make New York City uh, more vibrant, more engaged, uh, better invested in our future for all of us. Uh, I am proud to be part of a movement to make New York City truly the greatest city in the world. Um, I've, been part of New York's, uh, I've been part of Civic Hall for three years now, and I have no doubt whatsoever that Civic Hall will deliver, will fully deliver uh, on transformative and substantive opportunities uh, for individuals like me and individuals like so many people who are waiting to tap into their potential, to find a way uh, to, to really represent their communities, to do better for their communities, and to make New York City more inclusive and more representative of all, all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for- Mr. Yes. Chairman, if I, I just want to mention one other thing. Um, as much as we're here and we did testify, and we are definitely in support of this project, I, mean, I do want to know the sympathy I have for the folks in this audience, um, having been many, many times more than not on the side fighting with the mayor on these issues. So uh, I do want to encourage the administration to do something completely uncharacteristic and actually sit down with folks and continue to work through these problems. I know how hard you're working at this. We do support this, but you know, again, I can only hope that the administration comes to the table uh, and actually works with people because at the end of the day, it's about everybody trying to get something done right. Thank you. Th thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, the next panel, uh, Marlene Silverman. She left. She left. Okay. Shelley Fremont. Peter Feld. Ros Rosalind Allison. And Claire Martha Lohr. Yeah, Martha Lohr. Martha Lohr.
and David Eisenbach. John Center. Thank you. you. You may proceed. Please press the button there. There you go. OK, better. OK. Uh, my name is Marilyn Silverman. I'm a resident of the area. I've lived here since. 1965, and at the risk of just repeating things that other people have said, I guess my thought is, having lived here for this long, I've certainly seen huge amounts of change that have happened uh, in the area, some very amusing, certainly, in the 60s, and certainly different, and um, you need change. Change is what life is all about. Um, and I guess my thought when I consider what's going on in the neighborhood uh, around me, I live on 10th Street, um, is that I don't think we've ever had a change that threatens the sort of life force of what the area has been about as much as this has. And I think that's really important. And, and I also think that it just has to be thought of not as an either or. The tech hub is gonna do wonderful things for people, lots and lots of people who need it. It's the future. We have to support it. It is what it's all about. Um, but we also have to support our neighborhoods and though those should not be mutually exclusive things. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shelley Fremont and I just was wondering, where is everybody? I thought there'd be more councilmen there, or people there. Anyway, I'm here today as a longtime village resident to ask you to please save our neighborhood. The village is a wonderful, rare, charming neighborhood. We all know it in Manhattan, <clears throat> and it must be protected. I moved here in 1972 to go to Parsons and I've raised my two daughters in the village. Now I have two grandsons, and I love it, and I can't imagine it changing. Um, I'm old enough to even remember when Lou Chow's was there, and it just is amazing to me to think of this neighborhood disintegrating. I know a stroll through the village puts a smile on anyone's face. And all New Yorkers, I don't think I've ever taken a leisurely walk through uh, midtown Manhattan. It's not quite the same vibe. If the village is bloated with shrinking sidewalks and scattered skyscrapers, the charm will be lost forever. We won't get it back. It's something we need to protect. You remember Penn Station and how it was destroyed, this could happen to our sacred village. New York needs these little oases of low buildings and light and air. Other than Central Park, the, there is no place like the village. I mean, where you can see sky as you take a walk. Now is the time to save this endangered neighborhood. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claire Martelur, president of our co-op and a resident of 21 East 10th Street for the last 39 years. I speak for many in my building who unfortunately couldn't be here today. I'd like first to thank the city council for their time in giving our community the opportunity to express concerns about the pending approval for the Tech Hub without providing the necessary and much needed zoning protections for our neighborhood. The Tech Hub will significantly increase the out of character development in the predominantly residential neighborhoods abutting it to the south and it is in fact already doing so. 
We are already seeing tall office towers and large hotels being planned and built in this area, which is largely low to mid-rise and mostly residential in our community, in part because of the planned tech hub, with many more excessively large and oversized buildings to come if the tech hub is approved. We have proposed a fair and reasonable solution. Allow the tech hub on 14th Street and at the same time provide zoning protections for the neighborhood to the south to ensure the residential character is preserved and in any new development is in keeping with the neighborhood. For over three years, we have supported a rezoning plan that is reasonable which was endorsed by every elected official and both community boards in the area, which would impose reasonable height limits with new development consistent with what's there now, while providing beneficial incentives for including or preserving affordable housing while still maintaining the predominantly residential character of the neighborhood. Nonetheless, the mayor adamantly refuses to consider such options or offer any alternatives to work with our community. Thus, we strongly urge you to reject the proposed Tech Hub rezoning, which would irreversibly damage the Greenwich Village and East Village neighborhoods unless the requested neighborhood zoning protections are also approved in conjunction. Thank you very much for your time. My name is David Eisenbach. Uh, I come here as a resident who lives around the corner from the proposed tech hub on 12th Street uh, and as a small business activist uh, who uh, led uh, the fight for the Small Business Job Survival Act, which uh, Carlina Rivera uh, is a co-sponsor of, and we expect to have a big battle uh, this, this fall and winter uh, to pass this needed legislation for small business. Uh, I really appreciated uh, the council members' skepticism about the impact of this tech hub on small businesses in the neighborhood. All right, a bunch of makers going to a step up space and having lunch in a pop up market is not New York. New York is Vasilka. New York is small businesses. That's the East Village we love. That's why we pay the crazy rents we pay to live in our neighborhood. It's about the street. And I'm tired of this administration coming to us with proposals to take away our city's resources, like Elizabeth Street Garden, and pretending that it's about affordable housing for seniors. I'm tired of them taking away libraries, like Inwood Library, which we're going to testify to fight against the rezoning of Inwood. All right? I'm tired of them giving away hospitals, all saying that this is for the public good when it's not. It's a cover story, and this is another one of those examples. I'm John Center. Ladies and gentlemen, when you listen to me today, please hear my like-minded neighbors as well. At least 68 couldn't be here because they're working. I am not against the proposed 14th Street Tech Hub. Rather, I am for my community where I've lived for 40 years. Out of place commercial development between Union Square and Astor Place is rampant. I demand that fair and appropriate protections for the adjacent impacted predominantly residential neighborhood be enacted as part of any tech hub plan. If such protections are not granted, we will see only more out of scale development, luxury condos, large office buildings or hotels. The tech hub plan will make this worse. The right thing to do is to create a win-win whereby the tech hub is accompanied by fair protections for Greenwich Village and the East Village as called for by community boards two and three Borough President Gail Brewer, and thousands of neighborhood residents. Carlina Rivera, my councilwoman, I followed your suggestions, remained engaged and organized, attended community meetings and public hearings, reached out to neighbors and others, spoken, written, emailed, and called. Now we need you to keep your campaign pledge. I have your back and will enlist others to stand with us. Speaker Corey Johnson, Chair Moya, Councilwoman Rivera, and members of the Council of the greatest city in the world, you are strong and have enlightened or stood up to the mayor on other issues. We need you to do that now. 
we need your help. If and when fair and reasonable neighborhood protections are in place, vote yes on the Tech Hub. Win, win. That's right, that's just. Without neighborhood protections, vote no on the Tech Hub. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. We will be calling up the next panel. Uh, Santos Rodriguez. Jesse Lehman. Andrea Gordillo. Joe Lobenthal. Lobenthal. John Friedman. Santos, uh, Jesse, okay, Andrea, Joel, and John Friedman, no, Amy Harns, Amy, okay. Okay. Can we get some quiet, please? Thank you. Good afternoon, council member. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon, council member. Uh, uh, my name is Santos Rodriguez and I'm here to testify on behalf of Gaila Barbara, President of the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York and Vicinity. I'm here to testify on behalf of the Union Square Training Hub Center located at 124, uh, 124 East 14th Street. The Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York is an organization of local building and construction trade unions that are affiliated with 15 international unions and in the North American Building Trades Unions. Our local affiliate unions represent approximately 100,000 union construction workers, as well as advocate for all construction workers in New York City. The BCTC has always advocated for good paying construction jobs and safety standards to protect the men and women building our city. Working with direct entry programs like the Edward J. The Edward J. Malloy Initiative for Construction Skills, which I come out of, New York Helmets to Hard Hat, new non-traditional employment for women, we can continue to provide a career path within our communities. We are eager to work with RAL to help qualify local workers find work at the site from both community boards three and surrounding neighborhoods. RAL has consistently been committed to providing good jobs to its worker and consistently utilizes union labor for its projects. The project at 14th Street will be no different. If approved, this project will generate hundreds of jobs paying middle class wages. RAL's commitment to a strong workforce, work, excuse me, workforce is not limited to just union labor, but the project itself will provide needed training so workers can access the 21st century, 21st century jobs. We thank you again for the opportunity to testify in support of this project. We urge you to approve it so our members can go to work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon now. And uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Mo Moya, and thank you especially Councilwoman Rivera uh, for the extensive uh, you know, work that you have done and all of the listening you've done to your constituents and, and to so many stakeholders on this project. Uh, my name is Jesse Lehman. I'm the Director of Policy at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. We're a coalition of all of the groups in New York City that provide any sort of job training, career track, 
uh, programs, uh, educational programs, and direct placement programs to help people get good jobs. And that includes uh, organizations that provide construction skills training, healthcare training, and high tech training, including many of the members of the coalition that have been talked about a fair amount today. Uh, we uh, are here today to not yet take a position for or against the Tech Training Center because we think it has great potential to really be part of a career pathway for New Yorkers into the middle class, but that potential needs to be fleshed out a little bit more before it could be what it promises to be. Uh, and in particular, I want to highlight a pitfall of many common uh, similar scenarios to this that I, I think it's important that we avoid on this one. Uh, and then one uh, positive example that I would like to see this project emulate. So the major pitfall, and I, I heard it a lot today, is that we must avoid shortchanging the community benefits by counting empty space as a major public good. Space alone can be part of a solution, but programming, which is what is ultimately offered here, training programs to help people get these tech jobs, programming costs money. These job training providers are going to have to hire new trainers. They're going to have to engage in new outreach efforts to members of the community, particularly the low-income uh, community and the communities of color that have been talked about as the targets here to get into the tech sector. There's going to need to be outreach to those communities to get them into these jobs. All of that costs money, and providing space for providers is not enough. There needs to be a funding mechanism. And so I want to highlight the positive example, which is the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, uh, also an EDC New York Works project uh, that just earlier this year was announced, where they have partnered with local CBOs to provide an ongoing sustainable funding mechanism for the training programs linked to the rent that is being paid by the new companies that are moving into that facility. That's the sort of thing that we'd like to see emulated here. We really appreciate the hard work that the folks at Civic Hall are doing to reach out to the job training community. They're talking to the right people. We need to make sure that there are actual mechanisms to fund those programs, to fill this space, and make it live up to its potential. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair Moya and Councilwoman Rivera uh, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Andrea Gordillo, and I'm here on behalf of Lois Ida Inc. today. Uh, Lois Ida Inc. began as a grassroots movement in the Lower East Side led by Puerto Rican activists, artists, poets, and Latino residents in the mid-70s to combat, combat the effects of violence, poverty, discrimination, and disenfranchisement. Today, almost 40 years later, um, with our Lois Ida Center on 9th Street and Avenue C, we continue to uh, stand firm in our mission as one of the last surviving nonprofit Puerto Rican and Latino-based cultural and multi-purpose facilities on the Lower East Side. In recent years, we have seen the effects of gentrification on, in this community. Uh, Lois Ida has sought to ameliorate the uh, concurrent cultural, cultural erasure through education, public humanities, programmatic interventions, as well as neighborhood-wide com and community events such as the Lois Ida Festival, and recently in sponsoring some substantive neighborhood-based uh, participation and impact in the New York City's cultural plan, which the Community Board 3 has resolved to support um, in March of this year. Today, Loisida Inc. joins the dozens of elected officials and com community-based organizations and hundreds of local residents in support of the rezoning proposal um, as well as the project. Uh, we believe that the, the rezoning proposal and the numerous uh, community benefits negotiated through the ULERP process would advance the goal of cultural preservation of the dozens of ethnic and working class communities that have been under duress in recent years. Um, by, by reinforcing the intrinsic value, the neighborhood character, as well as the stability and retention of critical residential housing affordability in a positive sun game, in a win-win situation which ensures that no one gains at the other's expense as it relates to the many stakeholders in the matter. Thank you all for your time today. Okay, this is on. Good afternoon. My name is Joel Lobenthal. I am here as a downtown resident to insist that the City Council approve Tech Hub only if it concurrently constructs zoning and landmark protections that will safeguard the surrounding neighborhood and neighborhoods. We know that Tech Hub is meant to spearhead a massive commercial 
redevelopment of the blocks to the south and east, which will virtually or could virtually destroy what remains of their unique character. We already have seen one picturesque and historic low-rise building after another in this neighborhood demolished to make way for massively scaled, inappropriately sited condos, hotels, and New York University dorms. I have spent 50 years wandering in the village where I've lived most of my adult life, and I have seen not only the topography and the character radically change and not for the better. By the way, Luchow's was mentioned when I was on my 19th birthday, my grandmother, born in 1897, took me to dinner at Luchow's. She'd been going there for 60 years. Luchow's is gone, that whole heritage, continuity, lineage is gone made way for, uh, demolished to make way for another NYU dorm. Until the 1990s, this northeast pocket of the village housed many small independent used bookstores where I, as an aspiring budding writer, spent many an hour browsing and too many a dollar purchasing. These bookstores had been seated throughout the blocks for decades before. Again, my father, now 88, remembers them from his student days in the 1940s. They are all gone now, forced out by wildly inflated rents. Only the Strand remains, which I believe does own its own building, which is why it survives. To reiterate, no zoning protections, no tech hub. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Amy Harris. I've been a resident of the East Village for 15 years, which is a pittance compared to so many of my neighbors. I just want to project a minute into the future and think about the consequences of this decision. Um, we, this is a Pandora's box, as we've heard frequently at different hearings. This developer may be thinking about benefits to the neighborhood, but there's no guarantee that future developments and developers will give the parcels of land that are in danger the same consideration. And we are, in fact, and that's why we need zoning protection now. We are in fact a neighborhood. We do not aspire to be Midtown South. Um, we support and need the small businesses that are in our community. In my small area alone, in the last few years, we have lost a butcher, a cheese shop, a bookstore, a jewelry repair store, a shoe repair store, and a laundromat. These businesses were often owned by or employed residents of the East Village, a number of whom were immigrants or single mothers who relied on those jobs which are now gone. The businesses that tend to go into new developments tend to be chain stores. We don't need more of those in our neighborhood. We need people like Jimmy's of Jimmy's 43 who gives his back space for free to artists every weeknight in order for them to develop their work. We need people like Moisha from Moisha's Bakery who gave coffee to first responders when the buildings on Second Avenue sadly went down. This is what we need to maintain our community and I'm scared that we will lose these small businesses as landlords push them out in favor of businesses that cater to tech employees and um, and tourists who will be flooding the neighborhood. In addition, these new constituencies that will be coming to our neighborhood will be transient or will only be there during the day or for brief periods of time. They will not engage in the civic life of this neighborhood. They will not volunteer at community gardens. They will not sit on boards. They will not um, speak out if a bar wants to open two doors down from another bar, which has been a chronic problem for this neighborhood for a number of years now. We need to protect our neighborhood, and to do so, we need zoning protections now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for testifying today. Sorry. Next panel, um, Catherine Schoonover, Marilyn uh, Appleberg, Mary Fran uh, Loftus, Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth, sorry, I can't even see. Len, 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 Languith, and Susan Kramer. Catherine, is that you? Okay. Uh, Marilyn? Mary Fran. Oh, Mary, oh, sorry, Marilyn. Mary Fran. Susan? 
Elizabeth? Okay. Uh, Judith Stonehill? Judith? Yep. Okay. Give me an extra one. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Schoonover, and I live in the area south of the proposed tech hub. I'm here to express my opposition to any approval of the tech hub unless protections in the form of landmarking or zoning, or preferably both, are put in place simultaneously. The area in question has long been largely residential with commercial businesses that support a residential neighborhood. Now we are already seeing the transformation of this neighborhood into a place we don't recognize, a place with 300 foot tall buildings and 300 room hotels instead of the mid to low rise residential buildings that have characterized the neighborhood for decades. If the tech hub is approved, this transformation will accelerate alarmingly. It is not that the residents of the neighborhood are against affordable housing. Indeed, much of the housing there now is relatively affordable. The Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation has proposed a zoning change that would incentivize affordable housing while preserving the mid to low rise nature of the area. But the mayor and the Department of City Planning have rejected it out of hand and said they would not even consider it because it does not involve a massive upzoning which would be a windfall for big developers, a group that the mayor seems to court at every turn. The rezoning plan that has been proposed by GVSHP has been endorsed by every elected official and both community boards in the area. It would not only not downsize the area, down zone, excuse me, but in fact would allow a modest upzoning for those developments that include affordable housing and only impose height limits for new development consistent with what's there now. I strongly urge you to reject the Tech Hub rezoning, which would irreversibly damage Greenwich Village and the East Village, unless the requested neighborhood protections are also provided at the same time. Thank you, Council Member Rivera, for insisting on the, these protections as an absolute prerequisite to your approval of the Tech Hub. Thank you. Mary Fran Loftus. I live on East 9th Street surrounded by new luxury condo construction, <coughs> East 11th Street where five residential buildings were demolished to make way for a 300 room hotel, and the Death Star, which in the current Harper's Magazine, Kevin Baker describes as, quote, the single worst act of vandalism in New York since the original Pennsylvania station was torn down, end quote. For years, along with thousands of local residents, community boards two and three, and every local elected official, I have urged Mayor de Blasio to approve common sense protections for Greenwich Village and the East Village south of Union Square, where oversized and largely commercial development is destroying the character of the neighborhood. The Tech Hub plan will only make this worse. I am here today to insist that until mayor, the mayor approves fair protections for the surrounding neighborhood, you do not approve the Tech Hub Euler. If this project passes, construction will likely take place during the extended L train shutdown. Chances are that those activities will restrict part of 14th Street, causing further stresses to our community. As a New York City taxpayer and voter, I urge you to do the right thing create a win-win in which the Tech Hub is accompanied by the appropriate protections for Greenwich Village and the East Village. In 2008 and 2010, although we desperately needed such protections, they were denied us. A decade later, we need them even more. Thank you. Hi. I'm Elizabeth Languis, and thank you for allowing us to testify here today and for holding this hearing. I'm in this beautiful room, I'm inspired by the quote that's above you from Abe Lincoln, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And I only hope that Mayor de Blasio is listening to that quote, because it's clear from the testimony we've heard today that the people and the residents of the area around the Tech Hub are demanding protection for the, for the village and for our area. Um, I'm a long-term resident of uh, 4th Avenue and 12th Street, 
And during the time that I've lived there, I've witnessed the ravages of all the inappropriate development on the fabric and texture of our neighborhood, starting with the canyon of dormitories, including a 26-story dormitory on East 12th Street that destroyed a historic church, uh, to now the current uh, development of a Moxie Hotel tearing down five historic uh, rent-stabilized apartment buildings. And the last thing that we need is a party hotel, and that's the last thing we need in that neighborhood. What we need is affordable housing, what we need are residents, what we need is common sense development and zoning protection. I've also witnessed the loss of a couple of uh, long-standing stores, small businesses, just in the last few months. A hardware store that had been in the neighborhood for 20 years or more has now disappeared, um, as well as uh, dry cleaners has been there for at least 20 years. And instead, what we see is a proliferation of fast food joints that are no cash, that clearly are not catering to the residents of the neighborhood, but catering to the people who work in the tech centers. Um, and so none of that is supporting our neighborhood or the residents. So I thank you for the hearing. I thank you for your support of our uh, desires and what we need for our neighborhood and urge you to not approve the tech hub without any uh, accompanying protections for our area. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have to press this? No. Okay. Thank you. I'm Judith Stonehill, longtime village resident. <clears throat> and as a village neighbor, I ask City Council to protect our historic neighborhood from out of scale commercial development, from 300 tall office buildings, and as so many have, have said, 300 room hotels in the East Village and Greenwich Village. I strongly urge you to reject the Tex Hub rezoning proposal unless protections are provided for the adjacent village neighborhoods. <clears throat> as a village homeowner for many decades, I can attest to the importance of protecting and preserving a much loved community. There is a very real danger that our neighborhood will lose its unique and irreplaceable character unless it's protected by the members of the city council. There is a win-win proposal on the table. Allow the tech hub on 14th Street to provide zoning and or landmark protections from the neighborhood to the south to ensure that its character <coughs> is preserved a new development is in keeping with that neighborhood. Thank you. Hello, my name is Susan Kramer. Um, I lived on 14th Street for over 40 years, hard to believe, but, um, and I was co-chair of Union Square Community Coalition from 2001 to six. And, um, but more recently, um, I have co-founded a tech expo and forum. I am very much in favor of encouraging growth in this sector and actually am in favor of the tech hub itself. But the city should not give this away while also allowing a zoning free-for-all that will forever change the character and charm of the neighborhood. The out-of-scale new building on University Place is a perfect example. I dread seeing what chain retail is going in there replacing the small businesses like the newsstand, the bowling alley where our kids played. Uh, Pizza, um, the pizza place, um, you know, where people had invested in the neighborhood and who knew us and who knew our kids and watched them grow up. Um, there is no going back once these buildings are built. Those, those little places that we loved are gone forever. The warmth and community will be gone forever. And you will have sold the soul of the village for what? Thank you to Councilmember Rivera for standing for sensible zoning protection and for representing your constituents so well. I hope all of your fellow council members will follow suit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Um, we'll be calling the next panelist. Um, Tahira, Adams. Tahira Adams, Steve Hendrick, Joyce Ravitz, Scott Hobbs, Vicatina Jones. Thank you. Brittany Armstead.
Thank you. We'll start with you. Just state your name. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Moyer and members of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. My name is Brittany Armstead, and I am here as a representative for Tech NYC. Tech NYC is a nonprofit trade group with the mission of supporting the tech industry in New York through increased, increased engagement between our more than 630 members, the New York government, and the community at large. We work every day to make New York the best place to start a tech company and to cultivate a robust technology ecosystem here. New York City's tech ecosystem is currently the fastest growing job sector in the state of New York. With more than 326 jobs, New York City's tech ecosystem is the third largest in the nation and has generated consistent job growth since 2010. The Tech Training Center will furnish crucial affordable space for training providers and community partners. It will provide countless local residents the opportunity to develop the skills and knowledge needed to succeed in the ever-growing tech industry, an industry offering stable, high-paying jobs. The center will also provide space for local businesses and entrepreneurs helping to further stimulate the local economy. Community Board 3's unconditional vote in favor of the project is indicative of the fact that residents of Community District 3 will undoubtedly benefit from this project and the opportunities it will provide. As the tech sector continues to grow, we must ensure New Yorkers of all backgrounds are provided opportunities to benefit from and to drive this sector's growth. The Union Square Tech uh, Training Center represents an innovative and important step towards accomplishing this goal. Tech NYC is in support of this proposal and we believe in the center's ability to serve as a vital job training resource for residents of New York City. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Moyer and Council Member Barrera. My name is Tahira and I'm a member of 32BJ. 32BJ is the largest property service union in the country, representing 80,000 service workers across New York City and more than 163,000 up and down the East Coast. Our union supports responsible developers that invest in workers and economic justice. And so I am here today to offer our support for RAL's proposal at 124 East 14th Street, where RAL has committed to creating high quality permanent building service jobs that will support working families. These jobs will provide families sustaining wages and benefits that will allow workers at 124th East 14th to continue to call New York home. I work as a security guard at the World Trade Center and I know firsthand how life-changing a prevailing wage job can be. To this end, I want to share that RAL's commitment to providing good building service jobs extends beyond this site to their broader portfolio. RAL has a historic relationship with 32BJ, and we are proud to work in partnership with them to strengthen labor standards and communities throughout New York City. The Union Square District, known for its diverse economic activity, is an example of how New York neighborhoods can flourish when we work together to ensure inclusive development. We believe that the many investments in good jobs and workforce that are planned for the tech hub site will continue this trend and help support equitable economic growth. For these reasons, we urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Herrick, Executive Director of the Cooper Square Committee. I'm here to urge the City Council condition its approval of the ULERP application for the proposed 21-story tech hub on a commitment by the Mayor to rezone the 3rd and 4th Avenue corridors. Community Board 3 voted to approve the ULERP application uh, with five conditions two of which were related to mitigating the impact this development project will have on the 3rd and 4th Avenue corridors to the south. The Cooper Square Committee counsels and organizes tenants in the East Village and Lower East Side, and we see firsthand the intense displacement pressures that rent stabilized and market rate tenants are facing on a daily basis. We have already seen five tenement buildings at East 11th Street torn down to make way for the 285 room Moxie Hotel. We've analyzed data for the 58 properties in the, 30, in the 3rd and 4th Avenue corridors and found that 78% of them have a commercial FAR of 2.0 or less. It had been 90% of them before the Moxie Hotel development broke ground. The glaring problem is that the zoning for the blocks between uh, East 9th and East 13th Street 
allows for a 6.0 commercial FAR, which is substantial, and it places many low-rise residential buildings in the area at risk of demolition, uh, demolition and redevelopment as office buildings. There are 1,018 residential units in 3rd and 4th Avenue corridors. 88 are rent stabilized, according to DHCR records. Not only are all of these tenants at risk of displacement from the community through harassment and demolition of their homes, but the tenants paying fair market rent in smaller unregulated buildings are also have no right to a lease renewal and can be forced to move upon expiration of their leases, which will make it easy to empty the buildings and demolish them to build new office buildings for the growing Silicon Alley south of East 14th Street. It would be gross negligence for the city to approve this ULERP application without taking the appropriate step of rezoning the adjacent residential area whose zoning currently favors commercial development and does not fit the built environment. This needs to be rectified right away. The Cooper Square Committee recognizes the tech hub has the potential to bring a variety of benefits to the community, but all these benefits will be outweighed by the damaging impact of the tech industry will bring to the area uh, to the south. I urge you in the strongest terms to link any approval of this ULIP application to the rezoning of 3rd and 4th Avenue corridors in order to provide protections for the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Scott Hobbs, and I serve as the Deputy Director at the Union Square Partnership, a community-based nonprofit that works to better the Union Square 14th Street residential and business communities. I'm here on behalf of our Executive Director, Jennifer Falk, to express our support of the proposed Tech Training Center. Uh, Union Square is already an epicenter for New York's growing tech and entrepreneurial sectors, home to a long list of recognizable com companies such as Dropbox, Hulu, BuzzFeed, MasterCard, IBM, WeWork, and more. Today, over 22,000 individuals are employed by technology and professional service firms located in the Union Square District. And we have seen firsthand the positive impact these companies uh, and their employees have had on our community, be it supporting the more than 890 ground floor restaurants and retail establishments, many of which are small businesses or independent operators, or investing time and resources in community projects and programs. We believe that once open, the Union Square Tech Training Center will engage, train, and employ a population that is equitable and truly representative of our city. The project will build on the strength of our tech sector, arming more New Yorkers with the digital skills and knowledge to succeed in the, the 21st century workforce. In addition, the center will provide space for growing tech firms and foster civic innovation. This project will promote collaboration among our technology, workforce development, education, and nonprofit sectors. On behalf of the Union Square Partnership, I would like to thank the members of the City Council for their careful consideration of this application, which our organization believes will create lasting benefits to our community, the city, and the tech industry as a whole. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valentina Jones, and I'm the president of the Lower East Side Power Partnership. Our mission includes education, training, and affordable housing on the Lower East Side. It is vital that you consider written commitments of goals for training and job opportunities for the residents of Manhattan Community District 3. Uh, approximately 30% of our residents have household incomes under 20,000, while nearly 25% or earn more than 100,000. What we're advocating for is a, uh, at least a total of 30% um, for employment at every level, and that would be say 10% below 60% of the AMI, 80%. Um, uh, another 10 percent below 80 percent and another 10 percent below 120 percent. Um, these income criteria were determined looking at uh, NYCHA and Mitchell Lama, et cetera. We also would like that same consideration in terms of some type of written commitment to uh, civic hall and the di digital uh, skills training. So we think that there's a potential, but we would like to have it in writing. Our community has seen a variety of uh, developments come and say that there was going to be great community benefits and jobs for everybody, and I don't know a soul that has gotten this. The community feels, I think, somewhat hopeless. And as you'll see with this picture, one of the things that very often happens with these tech hubs, uh, that while there's $113,000 that people make, that's 10%. Uh, that are actually black or Hispanic, where you see the big portion of black and Hispanic workers, 58% make 19,000 in the uh, non-tech type jobs, the supportive jobs that are involved. 
So uh, what we're asking for is some type of written commitment for our community. I think that if we look at gentrification indicators, we see rising incomes, changing racial composition, shift in commercial activity, and displacement of original residents. We have a city that is very frightened of this kind of thing happening. And you have the opportunity. You can, um, you can do something now that I think would be much more about uh, inclusive um, growth. And I think that that, I think, would be beneficial for people of New York City, not just on the Lower East Side, but throughout the city, that these types of things are happening. So hopefully you will take advantage and do something that is very positive and that will have a positive mental health aspect on people throughout the city. Thank you. Good afternoon. Just push the button. I thought I did. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, Chairman Moya and my friend Carlina and everyone else in the room. My name is Joyce Ravitz. I'm the chairperson of Cooper Square Committee, an organization that has been working for lower Manhattan tenants for 59 years. Cooper Square Committee knows that the tech hub can benefit our community in many ways. Office space renting below market rate could bring hundreds of jobs to our area. Thousands of low-income residents, many from the Lower East Side in Chinatown, could get digital training and learn skills they need to enter professional workforce if what is proposed actually happens. But all of these advantages will be undermined by the ways the tech industry will damage the adjacent area to the south. The tech hub, as planned, would exasperate overdevelopment in the residential East and West Village neighborhoods. We must protect the surrounding neighborhood, its tenants, and small businesses. I urge you, as a long-standing tenant, as someone who has worked for many years to preserve and increase affordable housing, to save the small businesses essential to the distinctive character and history of this neighborhood. I urge you to link any approval for hub for this tech hub project to the three ULERP applications that will rezone third and fourth avenue corridors in order to provide protections for the surrounding neighborhoods. Others have testified today how affordable housing would be hurt by this rezoning unless you, the city council, can make it impossible for large hotels and big box stores to be built on the third and fourth avenue corridors. The Cooper Square Committee sees on a daily basis how the displacement pressures that rent regulated and market rate tenants face. The City Council must follow through on its commitments to the tenants and small business owners who depend on you. Approval of this ULERP action, please take necessary steps to rezone the residential area in the third and fourth avenue corridors, stop large commercial developments, no rezoning of 14th Street for a tech hub that would exacerbate overdevelopment in the residential West and East Village neighborhoods to the south should be approved. A tech hub without neighborhood protection is completely unacceptable. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for your testimony today. I'll be calling up the next panel. Uh, Monica Ritter Spoon, Soon Spoon, Hendrick. The the wart. Martin Tesler. Tim Tucker. Barbara Nevins Taylor. Tim Tucker. No Tim Tucker. Okay. Uh, Barbara Nevins Taylor? No? Hendrix DeWart? Monica? Is that you? Monica? Yep, okay. Um, Kathleen Huller? Huller? Trevor Stewart? 
No Kathleen? Giada Lobomirsky, Giada, no, Siegfried Zelt, no, Philip Porter. Jay Oliver. Do you have a Daniel Ravuzzi? Uh, Allison Greenberg. No. No. Allison, Sorry. okay. Kristen Theods. <clears throat> Kristen, are you? Uh, we have, do we have Cornelius uh, Shekhan? Yep. Is he here or not? He's here. Yeah, um, did you get five? Yeah, that's five. Okay. So I'm, is, it, is this guy here? You could ask him just Tre your name. Trevor Stewart? That's oh, you, okay. No. Yep. Perfect. So, if you could just state your name, we can begin. Hi, I'm Monica Rittersporn. I'm a lifelong East Village resident. Um, please vote no unless protections for the Greenwich Village and East Village neighborhoods directly adjacent to this tech hub between Union Square and Astor Place are agreed to by our mayor, who many of us are very disappointed in him not coming to the table on this. Please encourage him to do so. Thank you. My name is uh, Trevor Stewart. Um, I've lived in the village for 36 years. Most of my career has been around uh, technology. Um, in that sense, I'm a huge supporter of the Tech Hub. I think it will bring jobs. I think it will bring prosperity to New York. However, um, this cannot be done at the cost of basically destroying what is a low-rise residential and small business neighborhood. Um, I want to uh, uh, firstly just join with what uh, GDSHP's position is. I think, uh, I'm not going to repeat it, but I think Andrew Berman and his team made an outstanding presentation in terms of the possibilities that are open to the administration and uh, I support that fully. I also want to thank uh, um, you, Councilwoman Rivera, for your principled stand on this matter. It's, it's, it's greatly appreciated. It's unconscionable uh, that the mayor refuses to engage with the neighbors uh, while paying lip service to uh, affordable housing and uh, meanwhile providing nice breaks for his buddies in real estate. Uh, please stand up um, against the administration and do not vote for this uh, tech hub Unless, it is, unless the adequate uh, protections are in place uh, for the corridor. Thank you. It's a worldwide treasure. My name is, is on. My name is Allison Greenberg. I'm a villager, an idealist, a political club member, a voter, a taxpayer, a lawyer who represents working people every day, people who are of color, women, who are sick, who are vulnerable, I support unions. But let's face it, we go through this dance each time there is a controversial land use project opposed by the people. Is the clock running? Do I get two minutes? It's okay. It looks like Just I have four keep... seconds. We go through this dance each time there is a controversial, thank you, land use project opposed by the people who live and work at or near the development site. Each time the developer does its dog and pony show in the public forum, like here, but importantly, the developer really relies on backroom lobbying, access, and influence that the public does not have. We rely on 
local nonprofit groups who do such wonderful work, but let's face it, how can they contend with lobbyists, unions, good people who show up in t-shirts because they have to and they care? And we're not challenging you. I think we're all really united. We're probably all united today on a national level. It's a shame that we have to be divided at a city level at this time. The argument is always in favor of union jobs, diversity, and other compelling interests. We need Councilwoman Rivera, Chair Moya, Sadly, the members who left today didn't sit to listen to all of the testimony that's been going on for hours. They read, they spoke, they asked really good questions, but sadly, after sitting here for 10 years of these hearings, I know that those great questions that the council members ask, they generally do not act on. They don't act on the answers that they get. And we're asking for you council members to show integrity, to do the right thing. I'm here for the Inwood people who are going to be speaking this afternoon against what's happening to their neighborhoods as well. I'm here for Greenwich Village. I'm here for the city. We are at a critical juncture. We are begging you, don't be jaded. Don't just tell yourselves, this is it, the deal is done. We believe in you, we support you. But we need you to surprise us. We need you to surprise your constituents, your fellow New Yorkers. Say yes to your community, no to bad development. As an employment lawyer, I'd like to say that when I see millennials standing up for seniors in the tech industry, I will be very much in favor of a tech job, tech, tech hub with conditions but I haven't seen it yet, and I'm hoping to see it. I want to see young people standing up for people 40 and older, because they, these people, our seniors, need protection, and I don't see it really happening in a tech hub as is. So please do the right thing. We thank you for your service, and we're asking you to support this village. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Kirsten Theodos. I live on East 14th Street, two blocks away from the proposed tech hub. While the idea of bringing new jobs to the community is welcome, the tech hub will accelerate already rampant, out-of-scale commercial development and luxury apartment towers in the surrounding area. The real estate industry has already labeled the area the next Silicon Alley. I, along with thousands of other New Yorkers, call this area home. This predominantly residential neighborhood needs common sense zoning protections that would place reasonable limits on the height of new developments and encourage the preservation and retention of affordable housing. The unintended consequences of not rezoning the area around the tech hub will make it increasingly less affordable to longtime residents and small businesses, ultimately causing mass displacement. In order for the tech hub to happen, the city must, the city owned land needs to be rezoned. If the mayor is really committed to preserving and creating affordable housing, then the surrounding area should also be rezoned, or where recommended by our preservation experts, landmarked. In 2016, the City Council approved a rezoning for the St. John's Terminal site that, after com community outcry, included a series of neighborhood protections, such as landmarking the final phase of the Greenwich Village Historic District, air rights restrictions, and eliminating all planned big box and destination retail stores. I applaud then council member Corey Johnson, who made clear to the mayor that the only way he would get his approval for the rezoning would be to include neighborhood protections. Regarding the tech hub and rezoning the block south of Union Square to limit development, now speaker Corey Johnson said, quote, I know that area. It's right on the border of our district. To me, I think it makes sense knowing that area, seeing the developments going on there. And I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson for lending his very important voice to this discussion. It is my hope now that my council member, Carlina Rivera, honors her campaign pledge and votes no on the tech hub rezoning unless the city agrees to the necessary protections for the affected neighborhood to the south. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, city council members. Thank you for your time dedicated to this matter. My name is Cornelius Skihan. I was born at St. Vincent's Hospital, which is now a residential property. I began my early life on Horatio Street. I'm proud of my New York heritage and am sensitive to neighborhood integrity. 
I am a rank and file member of Local Union Number no. 3, which is affiliated with the Building and Construction Trades Council of New York City, and I am here to support responsible development for the 14th Street Technology Center. The history of RAL developers and the building trades of New York expresses an understanding critical to the relationship employing skilled tradespeople who are properly compensated for their education and experience. The workforce, this workforce combination is an unbeatable working partnership that expedites production with capabilities to resolve unexpected conditions and circumstances that face many construction projects. With the knowledge of this history, I am confident that RAL will continue its tradition of hiring union building trades contractors who agree to pay to, to good, who pre to, <laughs> who agree to good pay for workers with an acute responsibility of the real needs of the immediate neighborhoods and communities of New York City. Lastly, I'd just like to answer a question earlier from Council Member Rivera to, to the RAL representatives. I can only speak for Local 3. Um, part of the hiring practices in Local 3, and Local 3 hires locally and hires with a high diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, I will be calling the next and last panel, uh, Priya Ramanathan, Rama, Ramanathan, da Dale Rabuzi, Daniel Rabuzi. Kate Kirkland, Jerry Weinstein, are there any other members of the public that wish to testify? Okay. You may begin. We're all good. Thank you. Just thank you. say your name. It's been a long day for everyone. <laughs> um, thank you so much for this time. Uh, my name is Priya Ramanathan. I'm the program director at Perscolis. Um, I'm here to tell you how excited we are to be a small part of the Civic Hall at Union Square's Digital Skills Training Center and the value we believe it will bring to the community. Perscolis has been a New York institution for over 20 years, providing free technology training and career development services to over 500 New Yorkers each year, helping them to launch successful careers in the city's growing tech sector. As Priscolas continues to grow, we see this project as a logical future home for a Manhattan-based program location. We are currently in the South Bronx and Bed-Stuy, which is not the most accessible, as you probably heard from John, who's one of our graduates who spoke earlier today. Priscolas is committed to helping curious and motivated job seekers from all over New York City, most of whom are extremely underrepresented in the tech industry. More than 90% of our students are people of color, and a quarter are women. About a third of our students are young adults, and a third are immigrants. The average household income of our students is about $21,000, and about 70% of our students are out of work at the time that they enroll in our program. More than half of our students do not have any college experience, let alone, let alone four-year degrees. Our program provides job seekers the unique opportunity to gain a foothold in the growing tech sector, where they can earn higher salaries, decrease their need for public assistance, become financially stable, and lead happier and healthier lives. Perscolas has many existing relationships in the community with organizations like Henry Street, Chinese American Planning Council, and The Door. They refer candidates to our program, and we refer students to them for additional wraparound services. We actually have a young adult bridge program called TechBridge to help us enroll more young adults 18 to 24 in our program. With our new location at Civil Call, we, hope we can hopefully grow these programs, and we can provide even more opportunities for upskilling and career advancement to thousands of our alumni who live and work in the area. Civic Hall at Union Square Project prevents a unique opportunity for us to further our mission of enabling all New Yorkers to become full-fledged digital citizens. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is Daniel Rabuzzi. I'm a third generation Lower Manhattan. My parents lived and worked in Union Square. Uh, I live on Grand Street in the Lower East Side, and I'm delighted that uh, you are my council member, uh, Councilwoman Rivera. I am, however, speaking to you today as the executive director of MAUS. We are the youth tech organization that Civic Hall founder Andrew Roche founded in Union Square 22 years ago. For us, this would be coming home. We are now active in 94 uh, public schools across all five boroughs. We are deeply involved in uh, the entire CB3, the entire area there. Uh, for us, this is crucial for the young people. I'm really thinking of 
you know, the young people on, at the island school, right, on East Houston, who live in Baruch houses, who live in Vladic houses, the people who, in fact, are not here at these hearings. I said this at CB3, it's always interesting. We're talking about young people. Mouse, by the way, we work as young as second and third grade, all the way through 12th grade, okay? We are, in fact, the youngest, the ones who absolutely need to get in. They're not here at these hearings, so just pause for a minute while we've heard from a lot of us, like myself, who are on the older end of the spectrum. What I'm talking about with Mouse, I'm representing the young people in our district who don't have access to computer-aided design, to co uh, computer science, to virtual reality, augmented reality. These are the 21st century competency skills. The other point is proximity. We work closely with Perscolas. We work closely with CUNY. The ability to be all together so that the young person, they don't know who we all are, right? They want to know, hey, I can go from here to there, and we're all there to help them. And ultimately, and this is the real key, and I think this is Andrew Rache's real genius here with Civic Hall, is that we'll have employers in the same building. It is not enough. I've got space all over town. But that it's, it's far away from where the employers are. I work closely with the employers. They're on my board, right, all the tech companies, the established and the newcomers. They want to mentor. They want to have internships. They want to have it happen at their space. One of the most important things about this and why I would urge you to go ahead and approve this is so that the young person from Baruch Houses can have a mentorship uh, a hopscop away on the M14, okay, and get the skills that they need for the 21st century. Please approve this. Hello. Okay. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Keith Kirkland, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of WearWorks. And at WearWorks, we build products and experiences that communicate information through touch. Our first product is called Wayband, and it's a wearable haptic navigation device for the blind and visually impaired. Basically, we figured out a way to guide a person to an end destination using only vibration, and we helped the first blind person run a New York City marathon without any sighted assistance back in November. Um, we're also part of the Entrepreneurs in Residence program at Civic Hall, and we did all of that work sitting in Civic Hall office space. We couldn't afford to be in New York. We still can't afford to be in New York. We actually had to move our offices over to New Jersey because that was the place that we could find the best deals for our company. Um, one of the things that I believe that this tech center, Civic Hall, will bring to the community is, is access to opportunity. I'm also born and raised in Camden, New Jersey. It's one of the most dangerous and poorest cities in the country. And so I know firsthand what it's like to not have opportunity and not have access to opportunity. I'm sitting here speaking in a place that most of the people that I grew up with will never, ever have the opportunity to be. And for me, it really looks um, toward the future and what we're capable of bringing by equalizing the playing field so that everyone who has the ability and who has the drive can acquire the skill set that they need. I'm also ridiculously excited for what this is going to do for people of, uh, of, of, with disabilities. We spend most of our time working with blind people, 70% unemployment rate, median incomes across the country are about $37,000 a year. Um, and we see a huge opportunity to give them access to tech tools that will allow them to participate more inclusively in this 21st century that we're creating. So, um, for that, I highly vote that we, uh, we get this thing approved. Uh, thank you. I'm Jerry Weinstein, and it's an honor to address City Council. Each week, I profile a different Civic Hall member for our in-house publication, and after viewing about 100 members, I think I've cracked our DNA. Almost everyone in this community is, in, is some mixture of activist and entrepreneur. That is, whether our members are working with the homeless population, veterans, LGBTQ youth, or mental health or public education, they not only organize protests, but they work on solving concrete problems. They build resilience. As an ambassador, I get to work closely with founders and orgs to connect them with opportunities, and in my professional life to help them best tell a story that inspires and amplifies. What's happening just this week tells you how we're living our mission. At lunch today, what is left of it, two of our projects, Street Lives New York City and Human.New York, both working with the city's homeless, are having a public discussion on building with the community. Tomorrow night, the founder of Yonio, here in a summer fellowship, is offering a women's health workshop on pelvic pain. And on Thursday night, Pluto, a startup I proudly advise, kicks off a monthly meetup on building diverse and inclusive workplace cultures. The novelist Dave Eggers recently penned an op-ed in the Times 
pointing out how the Trump administration was atypical in its lack of support for culture. Go figure. <laughs> he wrote, culture expands the moral imagination and makes it impossible to accept the dehumanization of others. When we are without art, we are diminished people, myopic, unlearned, and cruel. I think this applies equally to what we do at Civic Hall. Our members who are equal parts activist and entrepreneur, in effect, fusing art and commerce, not only ferociously raising their voices, but building solutions with their communities and seeing them scale. With your support, we will continue to expand the civic imagination. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, one, one last time, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application, and LUs 144, 145, and 146 will be laid over. Uh, we will begin the inward rezoning hearing in about five minutes. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the members of the public who came here to testify. Uh, my colleagues, uh, we've been joined by uh, Council Member uh, Rory Lansman, uh, and of course, uh, always the uh, great staff uh, in our land use division. Uh, I thank you all for attending uh, today's hearing. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>